believe we are. All right, good evening, everyone. It's so great to have a nice full audience. Hello, I'd like to call to order the MS8051 uh, Board of Directors meeting, Monday, April 1st, welcome. Um, we are going to kick tonight off with some very exciting recognition. I'd like to welcome the athletic director, David Shapiro, and state rep, Steve Moriarty, to the podium. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> we have someone else to, rec uh, to welcome tonight, and that is state rep Ann Graham. Oh, hi, hi. Nice and to see you. Because we have two sentiments to present tonight, Annie and I have decided to do one apiece. Wonderful. It's only fair and only fitting. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll begin. I'm, I'm a State Rep. Steve Moriarty. I live in Cumberland. I represent Cumberland in the legislature together with Shabig Island and Long Island. It's House District 110. And I'm out of breath because I've just raced back from Augusta where we had a longer day than uh, anticipated. We're doing some cramming because we know we're going to get uh, snowed out on Thursday and uh, we don't have time for a snow day. So <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to be here tonight. And You've uh, seen, I think, both of us do this before. When, uh, when Greeley teams uh, win state championships, we present what's called a legislative sentiment to the team members, the coaches, the parents. It's really for everybody and the district itself. So uh, it's kind of a small script, but it comes in a nice uh, Greeley maroon binder, which is white on the inside, so school colors and all. <laughs> Um, and so I'll just read the text uh, for you and, and present this to, I guess, to Coach Dowling and, uh, and, his, and his, uh, his team members. So it reads, State of Maine, be it known that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing the Greeley High School Boys Indoor Track and Field Team of Cumberland, which won the 2024 Class B State Championship. We extend our congratulations and best wishes and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 131st legislature and the people of the state of Maine. And this is signed by the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House together with the leading officials of both bodies. And uh, this is jointly sponsored by uh, Representative Graham, Senator Peirce, and myself. So I'm thrilled to be able to make this presentation to all of you tonight, but particularly to the team and its coaches. This is your chance to be on stage and screen, so come on forward, fellas. And if one of you would share uh, with the group here and TV yeah. land uh, some of your experience. Yeah. Hi, I'm Charlie. I um, had no idea I was speaking until five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> So I just want to introduce you to some of the guys that came here tonight. Um, they are the life of the team, and I would say probably the captains. Um, so I'm going to first. We're going to start with Jonah Gibbard. He plays for the four by one hurdles and 400, um, scoring a, lo a lot of points in states. Was a big contributor. Bez. He sadly couldn't make states, but he was a big contributor all season for the 400 meter. Um, he ran the 800 meter, four by two. Um, just a, a great guy to be around with. Uh, we got Sam Kim, uh, placed for the four by two, uh, 200, and that's it. And, and uh, Sam and Ania, pole vault, and I myself, high jump and four by eight. Um, these guys are great to be teammate, teammates with. Um, Coach Dowling has always said, if you show up and you work hard, you're going to succeed. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and I'm really happy to say that we won states. So thank you so much. Uh, good night. Congratulations, guys. So next up. So hey, I'm Annie Graham. I'm the state representative for all of North Yarmouth and two-thirds of Gray, so my loyalties get a little split sometimes, right? So, no, not really. <laughs> Be being the wife of a coach and the mom of former athletes, my heart is here. So, um, so yeah, um, so I want to thank um, Steve um, Moriarty, Representative Moriarty, for, um, for putting this all together. He was really the one that, that put it all together and said, Annie, come and present one of them. <coughs> I'm like, sure. <laughs> And often this happens, we invite you guys up. Some of you may have been up to the legislature and sit in the gallery and we recognize you're there. So, um, so actually, I think I like this better. So, so I have the honor to present 
this legislative sentiment so the girls know what a ski team. So, um, so I will go ahead and read it. So the state of Maine, be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing the Greeley High School Girls Nordic Ski Team of Cumberland, which actually in North Yarmouth too, <laughs> which won the 2024 Class B State Championships. We extend our current congratulations and best wishes and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forth on behalf of the 131st legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Again, signed by Senator Troy Jackson, President of the Senate, um, Representative Rachel Talbot Ross, who is the Speaker of the House, um, and also signed by the Secretary of the Senate and the Clerk of the House. And again, I wanna thank uh, Representative Moriarty and um, along with uh, Senator Pierce, who was um, sponsoring this. So, my friends, Come on up. <laughs> I have to say that, you know, many of you know I only have boys, and I'm looking over at my, my good colleague, uh, coach colleague, uh, Coach Andresen, so um, I, I live and breathe soccer, as we just noted on the way in, and unfortunately, my kiddo didn't ever get this honor, but you guys, you ladies, certainly did so thank this is great congratulations <laughs> and any one of you want to speak really quickly yeah, you yeah, can yeah, do yeah. it yeah, all right <laughs> yeah just right. like uh charlie we had no idea we we're supposed to be speaking to like five minutes yeah. ago um just now <laughs> actually but um <laughs> uh, i just wanted to recognize all of the hard work um the nordic team has gone through we had no snow this season we had dry <laughs> land every day and we really had to put in the work and keep the spirit alive so yeah we'd also just like to thank our coaches coach d coach cam and coach emily and our parents for everything they've done for us and then also just the ski team because they have just an amazing community and I'm going to really miss them for since yeah. our, this is our last year. Oh, yeah, so we have, we have Lena, Ava, Evelyn, Ella, Riley, and Rowan. And who are Sylvia on Harvey, the yeah, and, triple winner. And also Eve 11, but she's running late, and she might pop in the door in like 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we just want to thank everyone um, for this amazing season, and yeah, I'm glad and we won. Yeah. yeah, thank yep. you. Great, congratulations. Great. Thanks everyone. So we have one additional recognition this evening. I'm gonna um, welcome Pathways Coordinator Andrew Fersh up to talk about the Can We Project. And Carl Francis, I'll welcome you too. <laughs> You're right. Uh, the Multiple Pathways Coordinator is the star of the show tonight, uh, at Mr. Fersh, and uh, the students that he works with on a regular basis. And today, tonight, I wanted to recognize one program in particular, um, which was Greeley High School's first year involved with it. Um, I don't, was it last summer or is it this fall? Um, we were approached, uh, summer, we were approached um, and invited actually to participate in a, pro a program called the Can We Project. Um, and we received a grant and we saw value in it and we decided to go for it. Uh, the Can We Project is, I'll keep it brief so he can explain it, is a way to revitalize uh, democracy, really. It's, uh, it's the ability for a diverse group of students to be together in a room, to grapple with um, topics and concerns of our day, and to um, have the ability to really listen and learn from everybody's different perspectives in order to formulate their own personal decision. Um, in the process, which I think is, is super important. And I'm very proud of the work that our students have put in this year and the work that Mr. Fersh has done to organize this. So 
Well, let me introduce Mr. First to you. Thank you. So the Can We Project, which is a, a, a under project of the Third Thought, which is a, a larger organization, focuses on the idea of developing skills in young people to engage uh, in dialogue across differences, which is uh, a thing we possibly are finding challenging in our society these days, uh, with the hope of, mo of fostering meaningful conversation and thoughtful civic engagement. A group of 10 Greeley students participated in several day-long workshops and one retreat this year where they practiced these skills. Uh, it was really wonderful to work with these thoughtful and committed young people, and it was inspiring to see how much they deeply care about making the world and even more specifically their community better. Uh, uh, just like Mr. Francis, instead of me talking about it, we'll just quickly have a few students come up. So two of those terrific people are Brady and Audrey, who will share a little bit of their experience with you. And thanks so much. Thank you. Um, they both just talked about the Kenry Project, so I'll skip that part of my speech. But basically, um, Overall, it was having conversations with other people without it, without it entering in like arguing or hating each other in the end, which is great. But the Kenry Project was an amazing experience. At first, Mr. Fursh brought it up to me and I said yes, because I trusted him. But if I'm being honest, I was a little scared. I didn't know what I was going into or what to expect. So over, over this year, we had three meetings, two here in the Geiger Room and then one in Augusta. And if I had the opportunity to do, it, to do it again, I totally would. My favorite part was talking with everyone and sharing our stories and opinions. While yes, we share some of the same opinions, we have different reasoning. One of the things we talked about was how you need to hear all sides of the argument. If you only hear one side or don't listen to other people, you won't get anywhere. And you don't have to agree with the person in the end, but it's good for understanding. So we talked about one thing that, like, the quote being, you don't have to agree, you just have to accept. So an example of this is, I am a distance runner, my brother's a sprinter. I think distance running is harder than sprinting, but my brother thinks sprinting is harder than distance. And so I can see where he's coming from on that, but I don't have to agree with him. And <laughs> obviously, we're going to take this to a larger example, but running, yeah. So we can, we can apply this to other conversations that we have in the real life. I've taken so much from the Kenry Project and I use it every day in my life. And I would full heartedly tell you that if you can be part of the Kenry Project, you should. And I have a really great example that I wanted to share, but Audrey told me I wasn't allowed to share it. So you're gonna hear it from her in a few minutes, but um, if any of you are ever able to take part in the Kenry Project, I would say do it. So thank you. Okay, so this is probably my story, my favorite story to tell people about what I learned at the Canby Project. So basically, this is an extreme, but let's say you're in a parking lot, right? And you see this perfect parking spot, right? Front row, perfect. And someone cuts you off and they take the parking spot. You're gonna be upset. You might like, you know, have a little bit of road rage, right? But what if you find out that the person in that car just got a devastating phone call that the person, like a loved one in that store needs to go to the hospital. So the reason they cut in front of you wasn't because they just want to steal your spot or they're like, screw this guy, like I want this spot, not them. It's because they needed to get to their loved one. So taking this back to what we learned at the Can We Project, you never really know what is causing someone to have this opinion. You can disagree with them, but if you take a step back and see all sides of where they might be coming from, you can have a much, well -rounded, a much better well-rounded perspective. So yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. everyone. Okay, we're going to move to the next item on the agenda, which is the approval of meeting minutes. Can I get a motion, please, for the approval of the March 18th minutes? So moved. So moved. Christina. Okay, thank you, Christina. Can I get a second? <coughs> I'll second. Okay, okay, thanks, Cam. Everyone's like on different sides today and is throwing me a little <laughs> off. <laughs> Where is everyone? Okay, um, any questions or comments on the meeting minutes? <clears throat> Hearing nothing, all in favor of approval? Approval? 
unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so the next um, part of the agenda is public comment. I'm gonna read a short um, summary. Let me get my huge binder on the right order. Okay, so the board welcomes and recognizes the value of public comment and to ensure that public comment is fair and orderly, we follow procedures outlined in board policy BEDH and we ask that all members of the public do so as well. We follow this policy to help keep the meeting civil, respectful, and productive. We also ho hope that this allows for all community members who would like to speak <clears throat> to be heard. We ask that speakers use the designated podium when making their comments and speak into the microphone. If you're interested in speaking, please wait until you're recognized by myself, the, the chair. Comments by individuals are limited to a maximum of three minutes at a meeting. A clock is visible on screen to help keep track of time. After three minutes, the timer will go off and the comments should be wrapped up. Please state your name and town of residence before beginning your remarks. Residents and staff members will be given priority over non-residents within the allocated time frame. Our policy allows for 30 total minutes of public comment, although that can be modified at the discretion of the board. As a reminder, public comment is not a time for discussion, Q&A, or debate between the board and speakers. Rather, is it a chance for members of the public to express their opinions on school and educational matters. The board will not comment on remarks made by speakers during the public comment period. Please know that this does not mean we are not listening and it does not express any agreement or disagreement with your statement. Lastly, please keep comments respectful and civil. We are neighbors here, be kind. That includes members of the audience. Please do not interrupt or respond to a speaker's comments. We also ask that comments are addressed to myself, the chair. Please do not direct comments at or about individuals in our schools or community. I will note that I will stop any comment that is contrary to these rules and that individuals who disrupt the meeting may be asked to leave. So this is the general public comment. We also have uh, a public hearing on the school budget later in the agenda. Um, we'll, if, if people are staying for that item, they're also welcome to speak specifically about the budget at that time. So I welcome anybody who is here for a public comment. Okay, I'm not used to speaking to a bunch of people. Be patient with me. I know we got a three minute clock. The reason why I'm here is this proposal on the new elementary school room and the pre-K and the turf. I'm disturbed that those two are linked. They are separate issues and ought to be viewed on their merit. First of all, I'm also concerned about language. Turf is defined as grass and surface layer of earth held together by its roots. It is not artificial, PFAST turf. Regular turf promotes diversity. Uh, grass absorbs carbon. Artificial turf does not. I'll tell you, I also do not know the cost of the turf, and maybe I'll find that out tonight. The community has a right to know the cost of that turf on that field over there and putting PFAST into our community. Why I'm so concerned? I think we all know PFAS affects endocrine system, liver, thyroid, as well as neurotoxicity, immunotoxicity. The women in this room, I'm sure, are aware that PFAS is in the placenta. And this is as good as we can do. We're gonna put this out on this athletic field and put this known toxicity into our community. It has been banned in the EU, Quebec, several German cities. Recently in October, new California law laws allow towns and communities to ban it for its toxicity. Other, other communities in Florida and Connecticut the same. There were those who thought they were at an athletic disadvantage without artificial turf Here's a quote from the NFL medical director last fall. If, you, if it were your brother's son or father exposed to these um, chemicals, would you take the risk? The NFL has been trying to get rid of artificial turf, one, because of the injuries, and now two, because of their toxicity. 
and I don't think they run around worrying about their advantage. The U.S. national soccer team will only play on natural grass. I don't think it's hurt their competitiveness. I am deeply concerned, mercy, 34 seconds, huh, of where you're putting it. You're on an elevated spot. The drainage is going to go down. It's going to go through the elderly housing and those condos. As someone who's elderly, we have enough health issues. It is going to go down on the playing fields of our junior high school students, our elementary school students, now our PK students. Who wants the responsibility for passing PFAS, toxic chemicals, onto those children? Third, it's going to go into my neighborhood. We have enough cancer in our neighborhood. Yeah. Baloney. Um, can you that just being share said, your, your name? That I, I want that water that's going to accumulate that drainage that's going to come down there, who's going to test it? Who's going to pay for it? And who's going to stand up when the lawsuits come down around this? Can you just, just like share your Can you share your name and town of residence? Oh, good Lord. Okay, I apologize. Um, <laughs> that's that important. I'm, I live in Cumberland, 15 Meadow Lane. My name is Glenn Morazzini. It's nice to see some of you, and uh, I appreciate your patience uh, tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Glenn. Is there someone else who's here to speak? Thank you. <coughs> Hi, my name is Melissa Gatine, and I am a resident of Cumberland. I live at 325 Main Street, and I'm here as a neighbor uh, And in regards to lighting. So I have approached the town about this issue, um, but it is in regards to brown tail moth. Um, and the impact that light has on attracting the moths to the area. Um, and as somebody who is very reactive to brown tail moth, I'm asking the school to consider the amount of light that is on on Main Street during the peak time of brown tail moth activity. Um, and there is actually documentation on the state website about the impact of light pollution and the increase in brown tail moth activity. Um, I actually have pictures from last spring of the oak trees on Main Street on MSAD property with brown tail moth uh, activity on them. And so I would be happy to share those with you as well. Um, I will also make a plug for the birds while I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> because lights do affect migration. Um, and so again, I would just like the school to consider uh, reducing how much light is happening um, during certain times of the year in per particular. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> is there anyone else here to speak for public comment? Bruce Shaw and Blanchard Road in Cumberland. I'm here to talk about the uh, referendum. I think this uh, turf proposal and the school should be separate referendums. I personally am going to vote no on the turf, and if it's part of the school thing, I will be voting no on that when I'm really in favor of the school. I know we need the school. We don't need the <coughs> turf field. In fact, we just went through this with the town council a little bit here in Cumberland. Three million dollars is what the price tag is for the turf, a little over three million. It's the same number that the town council was throwing around for Little League fields. You're putting up new schools for people that are very young. They're going to need Little League fields. We already need them. I know Miles Hunt. I coached him in basketball. He's complained to me oh, for the last five years of not enough Little League fields. I would rather see the three million in Little League fields. I'm not in favor of the turf. I can tell you, out in West Cumberland, where I live, there are many people that will vote no on that turf. They are not in favor of it. I'm not. And uh, I suggest that you split those two referendums so that you know how true it is. If you get a no on the school, you won't know if it's the school or the, t or the turf that was turned down. And again, there's going to be a lot of negative about the turf, and, and I'm one of them. And I'm going to be campaigning against it. I don't want to spend three million on turf. I am willing to spend three million on Little League. I actually suggested to the council that the school take over the Little League because 
North Yarmouth right now is not participating in the cost of building any new fields. And if it was part of the school, it would be split percentage-wise by the school, uh, the two towns by school now. There's some advantages to having the school take over the athletic complex, make it part of the athletic complex. So again, the turf, I, again, I think you really need to think about whether you, when you put that referendum out, if you put them together and you get a no, you're not going to know why it's a no, really. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak during public comment? Hi, I'm Sarah Rose, North Yarmouth, uh, 107 Hollowell. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, basically going to agree with what Bruce said. I think that if we put the turf field in as a line item to separate, separate these two things, I think that you can get a real feel on what, whether the people want the turf or not. But if you put it in with the school proposal, it's going to sink the ship. And I've talked to a lot of people, and, and that seems to be a real sticking point. Um, I also want to put in a huge plug. Please consider the community model for preschool. There is a pilot program that is going on. We have less than 30 days to put it together. Um, it, is, it has to be started by the MSAID and you have to approach a community preschool. It can be a center base. It can be a family child care. One of them will pilot with the school. We have to clear the application process. That would be a Hail Mary, but um, it's possible. It's a one plus one grant, so the first year would be paid for by the Department of Education. I believe it's the Department of Education. And then if they, the agreement is if they get the funding, it will be a plus one. So essentially the school would contract with one community preschool, theoretically for two years. Um, and then it would turn into a sustainability issue. So it, it's a possibility. I'm a preschool teacher <laughs> and a school age care. I've raised a lot of kids here. <laughs> One right there. Thank you. Is there anyone else here for public comment? All right, I'll close public comment. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to presentations. I'm excited to welcome back Andrew Hirsch uh, to present on the Pathways and Silo Projects. <clears throat> Hello, Andrew Fersh, Pathways Coordinator. I'm just going to dive right in. It has been a pleasure working with a large number of Greeley students on their independent study silo courses over the past two years. And that's what a silo is, it's an independent study. Uh, which the work of the silos for me represents a large percentage of what I do, but not uh, the entirety of what I do. Over the past two years, I have worked with over 80 students, helping them create credit-bearing independent study courses based on their interests, career aspirations, and passions. Uh, these courses, which represent an opportunity to study something that is not offered at Greeley High School, have run the gamut. Students have studied everything from disability rights to obstetrics, from personal training to biopharmaceuticals, from concert photography to drone pilot licensure, uh, from environmental education to sports management, and so much more. Students have interned at dozens of professional organizations, received dozens of professional certifications, have worked with several hundred professionals and fostered meaningful connections uh, with local professionals and community members. These courses provide one more way to offer students at Greeley an opportunity to learn connect, explore, and grow, and many of them uh, report that the individualization provided by these courses and opportunities has been transformative. In addition to these courses, the Pathways Office has been able to set up dozens of job shadowing opportunities, has provided programming such as the Can We Project on civic engagement, has supported a good number of senior projects, 
uh, and has also engaged students in regional and national competitions, including uh, Solve for Tomorrow, where students were Maine State champions last year, working with professionals uh, in Portland and at UMaine on PFAS remediation in rural drinking water, uh, and National History Day, where students are currently slated to head to states in just a couple weeks, amongst other things. Instead of hearing from me, I figured that having a collection of students share their experiences was the most meaningful way to hear about the programming so that you know how impactful it has been for students here at Greeley. Starting off, Brady will share about their internship with USA Swimming. Lauren will talk about her work with Maine Youth for Climate Justice. Chloe and Alina will talk about their filmmaking silo. Violet will share about the novel she wrote with the support of a writer in Portland. And Audrey will share about her two medical related silos. I want to thank you for the support of this programming and of the students. The students you will hear from tonight have worked incredibly hard, accomplished so much, and they've truly only just begun. It is my hope that Pathways programming will only grow, offering even more opportunities for students to learn experientially while fostering meaningful connections with the community. Thanks go to the school board for supporting this programming, for the incredible support and encouragement of the district and the Greeley High School administration, uh, to the hundreds of community partners who have given of their valuable time and expertise, and of course to the students who is, are the entire reason we do this and who have poured their hearts into the work. So without any further ado, here's Brady. Thank, thank you, thank you, I am back already. Um, <laughs> dear, dear school board and the Cumberland North Armouth community, um, I've spoken at a few school boards already, but I am Brady Hale, a senior at Greeley High School and I'm here to talk about the Multiple Pathways program at Greeley High School. Mr. Fersh and I met around halfway through my junior year of high school. I knew I wanted to do, wanted to do an internship, a job shadow, or something similar. However, I had no idea where or what direction to head in. After a few meetings with Mr. Fersh, we decided to wait until my senior year to start any new internships. So we set up a meeting at the beginning of this year, and I still had no idea what I wanted to do. I told Mr. Fersh that, and he said, if you could do any internship right now, what would it be? And instantly, I said, USA Swimming. So we started to, get, started to get to work. In that same meeting, I sent an email to USA Swimming asking if they had any internship opportunities. And a few days later, they responded, yes. It turns out that I was the first official intern that they've ever had, and I would not have gotten that opportunity without Mr. Fersh. With USA Swimming, I worked with the diversity, equity, and inclusion team and I've learned a lot about myself and DEI. First, I love podcasts. I realize that I learn so much better listening to podcasts than I do reading a book or looking at a website online. I learned that there's a lot more in DEI than I originally thought, and I learned a cool word, which is intersectionality, which basically is all the pieces that make you who you are. So uh, an analogy with this, if you think about the roads leading into an intersection, all those roads are the different pieces of who you are. For me, it's swimmer, brother, twin, runner, lifeguard, and it goes on and on and on. They're all the pieces that make you who you are, make you unique. I also got to shadow the town manager, Bill Shane, for the day, and I learned so much from him. And originally, I didn't know what I was, also I didn't know what I was expecting that day, but I learned a lot about the town, both Cumberland and North Yarmouth, and the different projects that were happening around town. When I first started talking to Mr. Fersh, I had no idea what I wanted to do in life. And while he did tell me that as a junior in high school, it's okay to not know what you want to do for the rest of your life, it still made me a bit nervous. <laughs> and after my internship and shadowing Bill Shane, I have a better idea of what I want to do in the future. As of now, I want a dual major in political science and history. I don't know where I'm going to college yet. We're still figuring that out. <laughs> and I would not have known that without the work that I've done with Mr. Fersh. I think silos and multiple path in the multiple pathway program is amazing. On my paper, that's in all caps, too. It allows you to get real world, real world experience while being able to find your true self and see what you're interested in. Some people know that they want, wanted to go into the medical field, sports manage management, or something similar. But I did not. So this experience allowed me to learn so much about who I am as a person and what I enjoy doing. So thank you so much, and have a great rest of your evening. Hi, 
Oh, hi. Um, my name is Lauren Hester, and I am also a senior at Greeley High School. Um, I interned with Maine Youth for Climate Justice over a span of, I'm going to say, late June to November, December of this year. I did many things there, uh, spanning from grant research to graphic design, both of things before going into this I had no clue about, so it was great to learn a new skill. But I think the most important thing I learned during this internship was about youth activism. Uh, for example, I was able to attend, uh, attend a pine tree amendment event that took place at, Bo at Bowdoin College. Um, and there was a youth speaker talking about her experience. She's from Montana, and she was talking about her experience of how she sued with a, gr with a group of other young students. She sued the state of Montana for violating their right to a clean and healthy environment. And it was really inspiring, me, inspiring for me to see um, s people just like me who are attending high school who are scared about their homework or the big test they have coming up doing such inspiring things at th the age that we are. And I think that it taught me that situations can be scary with big audiences, but that doesn't mean that you have to be quiet. And that doesn't mean that you can't speak your truth because if there's one thing I've learned from this internship, it's that I have a voice and that I can use it and it can make a difference. And I wouldn't have been able to really master that idea without this internship. So thank you. Hello, my name's Chloe Schumann. And I'm Alina Schumann. Uh, as you can tell, we're twins, but we also happen to be doing a silo together um, on filmmaking. And when I, uh, if you guys didn't know, but you probably don't, um, Alina and I studied abroad for our junior year in France, but we were completely apart. And I happened to be in a northern region where I was able to study French cinema, and I absolutely loved it, and I decided that I would want to continue this passion in college, but there I was able to direct my own short film, act, script write, edit, and I didn't think that at Greeley there would be a, pa a platform for me to continue this passion throughout my senior year, um, but that did change. <laughs> yeah. Uh, throughout my years at Greeley High School, I knew silos were a thing, but I never thought I would be able to um, have the opportunity to do one myself. Um, but fast forward to my last semester of senior year, and with Mr. Furster's help, um, Chloe and I decided to do a silo on the pre-production uh, stage of our short film, which we will be making with our friends as our senior project. Uh, this pre-production is the stage in film that takes place before the filming even begins. And it turns out that film, planning a film is harder than it looks. <laughs> um, and as you may know, Alina and I run GNN 10, which is Greeley's news network uh, that we film, edit, write, and pretty much produce. Um, but it turns out that this is completely an entirely new endeavor as making a short film is much different from two to three minute segments that we air to the school through our um, program in advisories. And it was actually really uh, inspiring to meet um, an actual filmmaker named Sam Brosnan, who showed us a little bit of the behind the scenes work that he was working on, which Alina will speak on more, but it was really inspiring to see all the work that actually is put into a s short film. Yeah. Um, like Chloe mentioned, we had the chance to work with a local professional filmmaker about learning how to script write, um, script writing, storyboarding, editing, filming, lighting, and so much more. Um, we even got to spend a whole day with him working on finishing the script, which we co-wrote, um, and learning how to edit on and color grade on DaVinci Resolve, a professional editing software. This semester, we've also learned how to work with local uh, companies like Teens to Trails and Gearshares for costuming, as well as Wolf's Neck for uh, filming locations. And on top of that, we've been working with so many Greeley students that each have their own expertise. 
like musicians, cinematographers, and drone operators. <laughs> um, without taking a silo, I would have never been able to learn so much of the pre-production side of short, short filmmaking. Um, and I'm so glad I got to do this at Greeley as before coming here, as I had, my last time coming to Greeley was my sophomore year. I really didn't think that there was a, a platform for me to, ex to learn more about this passion of mine. And taking this silo really has just been an incredible opportunity for Alina and I to work together on something we love to do. And since film is such a collaborative art medium, it is just wonderful that we get to do this uh, independent study together um, as we finish our, our high school careers together and go off our separate ways for college. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm Violet. Um, so for my silo, um, I wrote a 70,000 word novel that I'm currently in the process of editing. Um, I did so much writing already that I actually did not write a lot for this. <laughs> um, all my words are going towards that right now. Um, so it'll be pretty short. Um, I'm trying to get my final draft finished um, by the beginning of May. So I have this month to be editing. Um, after that, I will work towards publishing and turning it into a finished product. Um, even if I do not end up getting it traditionally, pub traditionally published, it's a, still a good opportunity to learn about that entire process, which is a whole separate thing than the actual writing process. Um, I also had the opportunity to job shadow at a main publishing company, where I got to learn about that whole side of things and how it, you get from an a emailed manuscript to a book on your table. Um, and I, that's a great head start to what it will look like to work towards that. Um, I've always loved writing, and this was just a wonderful opportunity to have the motivation and assistance I needed to create a final product um, that I can be proud of. I worked with a professional writer as well to get guidance on how to write with such a large goal in mind, as well as having a wonderful person to talk through plot lines and character development. Um, so overall, this opportunity was a wonderful experience I would recommend to anyone. I've always loved writing, as I mentioned before, and this was able to just push me to actually finish this goal that I've always wanted to accomplish. Um, I got to set my own goal and work towards it, which was something that was wonderful because I never got to do something like that before and say, I want to write this whole novel out and actually set the time aside and go through the editing process. Um, and I'm already proud of the first draft I've written, though it's going to be edited and edited. Um, as all writers say, you just keep making it better and better. Um, and I'm super grateful for every person that has helped me to create this. That's all I have. Thank you. Hey, I'm Audrey Cohen. I'm a senior here at Greeley High School. And like the other students here, I've been fortunate enough to do a silo with Mr. Fursh. Over the course of this year, I've done many silos, summing to over 200 hours of medical internships, job shadows, and a variety of different things. Among many things I've learned, I've learned two main things. First, my eyes have been open to what's out there and if, what you can do if you truly apply yourself. Second, is a sentence that Mr. Fursh told me in one of his emails. Bringing even the smallest bit of light to some who might need it is a, is a gift greater than most any we can provide. First semester, I had the opportunity to do a variety of physical therapy internships and job shadows. The second semester, I've dove into the medical field, both doing job shadows at local clinics, becoming a volunteer at Maine Med, getting certified in wilderness first aid, and I'm currently planning a variety of card making events where the, card, the cards will be donated to patients at Barbara, Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. We have a goal of reaching 500 cards. With the help of Mr. Fursh, my eyes have been opened to what's out there, the opportunities, opportunities that each and every person has. With my aspirations of going into the medical field, I truly have made connections and learned more than I can ever explain. However, more than just that, something unique that each student gains through their course of their silo is a sense of empowerment. Mr. Fursh has so shown us that each and, one of, one, each and every one of his students that if they can dream something, that they can find a way to do it. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I would have these job shadowing opportunities. For us to send an email to Mr. Fursh or stop by his classroom and tell him what we want, uh, our goal, and for, us to, for him to believe in us and our dreams is truly empowering. I'm very fortunate that Greeley has this course for its students and this opportunity 
to do a silo. At Maine Med, I'm a volunteer at the Elder Life Program. Many of the older patients in hospitals will come in for a specific reason, but their stay will be prolonged due to deliri de delirium. The volunteer's job is to go around and check on them. Some of the things that you hear the patients tell you sits heavy on them, heavy on you. A tragic part of being in the hospital as an older patient is you're often forgotten about. Some of these patients rarely get visitors and are often in the room alone. Starting out volunteering, this was something that I had a hard time dealing with. Naturally, I'd always try to, track, try to crack a joke and make them smile, or anything to improve their mood. But this isn't always possible. Talking this through with Mr. Fursh, I realized that taking a step back and just being someone that these patients can talk to, tell stories to, or even just sitting there and reading to them so they have some company. Something he told me in one of our many emails discussing this was, bringing even the smallest bit of light to someone who might need it is a gift greater than most any we can provide. This sentence has stuck with me and truly encapsulates one of the major things that the silo has taught me, along with an important lesson that I would never have truly learned in a classroom. Prior to this school year, I'd been thinking about doing a silo, but like many others, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I certainly had space for it in my schedule, but I was hesitant due to the open-ended aspect. There was so much we could do that it was hard to pick something. But with that, I truly believe that any student thinking of doing a silo should do it. Any parent of a high school student should encourage their child to consider it. And any school thinking about adding this sort of course should 100% do it. Thank you for letting all, those, all of us students and Mr. Fursh come talk about this and have a great rest of your night. Thank you so much for bringing this program forward and sharing the experiences and stories. Really appreciate it. So we have one other important presentation. I'm going to welcome the District Mental Health Specialists Eric Brown and Peter Scott up to share um, the results of the 2024 uh, Maine Integrated Youth Survey. Uh, provide a summary of the results. So thank you. Good evening. Um, we've got to set up a presentation here or link okay. it up. So. Okay, great. Bear with us. <laughs> Technological wizard here. So we got it. technological wizard is failing you. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. All right. So yeah, so my name is Eric Brown, um, the risk assessment mental health specialist for the district, so K through 12. This is my esteemed colleague. <laughs> I'm Peter Scott, I'm one of the social workers at the high school. Yeah, we're gonna um, present the main integrated youth health survey. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna call it the MIHA, so we don't have to say that every single time. Um, would you, MIHA, yeah, okay? Yep. All right, so. We're gonna to try to keep it brief, concise, a lot of information um, with the Mijas. I'm, I'm not sure if you have that in front of you, but it's a lot of details, a lot of information there. We're, gonna try, we're just gonna take some snippets of it and present their percentages of what's going on. So with that said, what is the Mijas? Well, it's a survey that's been uh, conducted every two years since 2009. It's uh, supported and sponsored by Maine Department of Education, Maine Department of Health and Human Ser Services, um, the CDC, it's a 45-minute survey. Um, it's completely confidential. Students do not put their name on it. And do not, no date of birth or anything like that. So there's real no reason for them to give false information. Great. It covers a wide range of topics from nutrition, physical activity, safety, substance use, and other risky behaviors. Uh, the data is used for a variety of purposes in evaluating student health risks and behaviors. And I'm, that's why we're presenting to you for policy making purposes and taking, taking a look at the, um, these issues throughout the district. Helps to point out the areas where improvements have been made and the survey also helps identify where students may still be at risk and areas where schools can take action. 
So I'm going to cover uh, the middle school, 7th through 8th. So there is a uh, MIHAS um, survey for 5 and 6th grades, 5th and 6th grades, but uh, that was, we did not have to do that this year. So I'm going to focus uh, specifically on 7th and 8th grade. Um, so the following grades, 7th uh, and 8th combined is 278 students for the school years of 2021 and 2023. Uh, the highlight data that I chose to... Uh, focus on was bullying, depression, suicide, substance use, and school climate. Uh, and we're going to compare those percentages to the state averages, which is a total of 15,222 students. So our 278 students compared percentages to the 15,222 students. Before I get started, I wanted to give a shout out. I almost forgot about this. A shout out to Rachel Lauren, who is an amazing um, social worker in, at GMS. Six through eight, and she was instrumental in rolling out the Mijas um, to the school, and um, actually instrumental in with help in putting this uh, this presentation together. So, and before we begin, I just want to just note for those of you who have raised teenagers or tweens, teens are raising tweens, teens. There's a lot of information that may be like you might think that's a high percentage. Um, I wish I could sit here and say, well, everything's going to be 0% for those at-risk behaviors. It's just not. It's just not because we're talking about an important, extremely important developmental uh, period in life. Um, this is the first time, 7th and 8th, they're actually um, they're searching for individuation, independence, individuality. Uh, they're trying to, uh, they're, they're curious. They, their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. A lot of risky behaviors. Uh, peer pressure, separation from all this sort of stuff's happened. So it speaks volumes to a lot of the per percentages you will see. It's not permission giving. It's not saying, I ah, don't worry about it. We're still focusing on it. We're still trying to plan. We're tr still trying to support our young people. So with that said, the first area, uh, percentage of students who reported being bullied on school property in 2021, it was 34.5%. We've had a jump of 9.9% in 2023. Um, not specifically, I wish I knew all the answers. I think next time they do the MIHAS, they probably should like have a little column of why, you know? Uh, that's, so we don't have the information of why it's gone up. But there's uh, some of my things that I would like to, you know, kind of touch upon. First of all, we're below the state average, which I think is, which I think is key, right? We're, we're worried about what's going on in our school district. But still, it's, it's important to compare it to the state averages as well. Um, something that's, so that it was a, this was the first question, followed by the next question, question was, have you ever been electronically bullied? So I'm wondering if there may have been a little crossover there. I'm wondering when this was first presented, if they thought maybe electronically bullied. It was, it's, for me, it's quite a jump. Um, so electronic bullying is, is uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a huge increase in social media and um, in bullying in that way. And the top five sites, social media sites, are, is obviously, well, Facebook. Even young people still use Facebook. They're trying to get away from it. <laughs> but TikTok, Twitter, which is now X, I think, Instagram, Snapchat, those are the top five. Did I say TikTok? Those are the top five um, social media outlets that has a lot to do with um, electronic bullying. So unfortunately, sometimes social media uh, bullying, electronic bullying can lead to feelings of de depression. One of those symptoms would be experience sadness and hopelessness for two weeks or more and stop the activities they once enjoyed. So 2021, it was 25.6%. In 2023, it was 30.5%. So a bit of an increase uh, for 4.9%, still below the state average. Um, yeah. Young people, uh, strong emotions happening at this age. <coughs> um, and lots of things. So it's, 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 it's the first time they're trying to fit in. They're trying to find their social group. And it's developmentally, as far as the brain goes, it's the first time they're making comparisons to each other. They're putting themselves under a microscope. They're critiquing every little thing they do, how they look, body image, all that sort of stuff. So, so there's lots of, not one reason why students are feeling sad, depressed, overwhelmed, lots of reasons. A percentage of students who reported having seriously considered suicide. 
Uh, this, this may appear shocking, but uh, in 2021, it was 21.1%. Uh, in 2023, we got 21.8%, so which is an increase of 1.7, which is actually 1% higher than the state average, which I found was, was pretty interesting. Um, and again, trying to keep it brief, but I found this article that was posted by the Washington Post, and I'm not saying this, it's this school district, but there was, it was the first time I'd read about a stat <coughs> of higher achieving schools are linked to students, higher anxiety, higher depression rates, higher suicide rates, or suicidal ideation rates. So I just wanted to kind of keep that in mind and, you know, for myself being a parent, we as parents, caregivers, just to kind of balance that out, a, a, a child's self-worth shouldn't be based on what they achieve. So I just want to, you know, kind of note that. Substance use. Um, have you ever had a drink of alcohol other than a few sips? So current is 15.4, which is up 7.5% uh, from 2021. I thought that was a big jump. Um, so this is ever, right? Ever had a alcohol other than a few sips? If you look at the asterisk on the bottom, it's uh, last 30 days was only 4.2%. Uh, so a little bit misleading, but definitely concerning. Alcohol is the number one um, um, drug that's used by tweens and teens. It's unfortunately accessible within homes, friends. Uh, so, uh, but very important protective factor, parents and caregivers, uh, young people view that their parents or caregivers would view their use as wrong. 96.7%, that's huge, that's big. So good work, parents and caregivers. Uh, percentage of students who reported having used, ever used marijuana, uh, current 3.7%, which is a 1.2% increase, which again, um, it's 5% lower than the state average. Last 30 days is 2.6%. Parents view as wrong, again. Huge protective factor, 96.3%. I'm actually, is, I don't know how you feel about it, but as far as the increase, 3.7%, uh, I'm actually kind of, I don't know, what's the word? Um, not happy, but I'm actually, I thought it maybe it would be a little, um, a little higher, just based on the legalization and based on uh, basically every corner has a cannabis dispensary at this point. Um, so in, in, in marijuana, unfortunately, has been um, kind of catered towards the youth, right? The packaging, you know, the gummies, the edibles, all that sort of stuff. So I'm, I'm actually kind of pleased to hear that it's not higher. Percentage of students who report have taken prescription pain medication without a doctor's prescription. Again, uh, a, a bit high, 6.3%, but lower than the state average of 8.9%. Last 30 days, 4.4%. The most commonly abused drugs, uh, opioids, Oxycontin, Vicodin, uh, the central nervous um, system depressants would be Xanax, Valium, and stimulants, um, Adderall, Concerta, and students view using prescription drugs as peer pressure trying to fit in. Um, maybe a weight loss supplement, um, and maybe for study habits. Perce uh, percentage of students who reported having smoked cigarettes, uh, NR. I think, I think, I'm assuming that it was not rated and not reported, that the percentage was so low it was not reported. I'm not 100% sure what that's all about, so, but because it wasn't reported in 2021, we have a 1.8% increase. Actually, the the, um, the trend of smoking has gone down the past several years because more education's happening. Students are viewing it as not, um, as, as actually a health risk now, so which is huge, uh, uh, lower than, the, in, in smoking cigarettes, lower than the state average. Uh, vaping, so 1.9% here in 2023. It's, it's uh, a bit of an increase by 0.1%, uh, again, 3.8% 3.8% lower than the state average. Percentage of students who reported being offered, sold, or given alcohol or drugs on school property. In current, it's 2023 is 5.4%, 2% lower than the state average of 7.4%. Now that's all combined, that's all drugs combined. That's 
alcohol, that's cigarettes, <coughs> that's vaping. So that's, that's all combined, so that's what's totaling the fund pointed out. Percentage of students who reported feeling safe at school. A bit of a dip, 7.9%, but to think about 86.7% of students that feel safe at school, I think that's a huge number. I think that's, you know, that's, that's 87%, that's, that's, that's enormous. Um, it's a 7.5% a above the state average of 79.2%. Um, a huge protective factor, students who answered that at least one of your teachers really cares and gives you help and support when you need it. 73%, that's big. One of the biggest protective factors is actually coming to school and having a support person present and somebody you can turn to if you're, having a, if you're upset. Um, so that's, you know, compared to state averages, that's 3.7% uh, higher. Percentage of uh, students uh, to identify at least one parent or caregiver to talk to when uh, what you're doing in school about every day or about once or twice a week. Good job, parents, caregivers, because this is huge. Open communication, open lines of communication, a, a huge protective factor is what's going on at home. So being able to keep those lines of uh, communication open. So 1.2% higher than the state average. Positive highlights of the MEHASC for grades 7 through 8. The majority of our uh, students feel safer at schools. 87%. That's big. Majority of our students identify protective factors of a teacher and, care and parent and caregiver. Majority of our students don't use alcohol, cigarettes, vape, marijuana, or prescription drugs, obviously. Um, but compared to the state average, we're all lower than the state average. Healthy, and there's some other questions. So healthy student body, um, positive, uh, positively above state average for eating fruits and vegetables, well above <laughs> state average. Decrease in soda, sports energy, drinks, sports drinks. There's been a huge decrease in that, which is tr tremendous. In physical activity, we're well above state average on that as well. So healthy student body, which, was, which is a healthy protective factor. Areas of concern. Percentage of students reporting having ever used alcohol has almost doubled. <clears throat> That's a concern. I'm worried about that one. Bullying remains a significant concern for our students, something we're paying attention to. We've been all rolling out a, you know, a bunch of um, um, anti-bullying bullying, um, preventative actions, including Mari Triplecock and Jason La Riviere, um, La Riviere going into actually all advisory classes and doing uh, bullying presentations. So depression and suicidality warrants our continued vigilance and scrutiny. And there was also a decrease, even though I said there's, you know, physical activity has, uh, is, is way above the state average, a little bit of a decrease with physical activity um, with our student body. So, so that's GMS, and at the end we'll, we'll allow some questions. Yeah, give me one second Thank here you. to switch over. And as Eric said, uh, we'll take questions at the end. I wanted to also give a shout out to Tiffany McFeatures, who's my colleague at the high school, who actually put the majority of the slide presentation together uh, and presented it to our staff for discussion and review. So here we go. I'll try to be brief on this for you. Um, like this little laser pointer here. Okay. So today, we'll look at the My House information from grades 9 through 12. We had 455 students participate. Um, again, this was data from 2023. We're going to be doing the survey again next school year. Um, we'll highlight aspects of the data in areas of bullying, suicide, depression, substance use, school climate, and look at how we compare to state averages, look at some trends, and reflect on opportunities, which I think hopefully that will be a valuable piece for you. Eric and I are going to share that at the end. So, a little bit different format. We use pie charts here, but you can see bullying. Uh, 2023, in the last 12 months, have you ever been bullied on school property? Uh, the people who answered yes at 19.4%. That is below the state average in 2023, which is below the pie chart there at 21.9%. Um, and you can see that that has jumped up from 2021. My, only th my, my theory on that has to do with COVID and the amount of time we were spending in school at that point. Uh, we're back in business here, and um, those numbers likely have crept up uh, for that reason, at least in my estimation. Depression. Uh, during the past year, have you ever felt so sad or hopeless almost every day, two weeks or more? Again, this is um, something from actually from the DSM when you look at um, evaluating depression. 
And you can see that 29.3% of our students answered yes, that they had had a period of time during that school year when they felt depressed. That is less than the state average of 35%, but still very concerning. Um, um, I think, as you know, as a parent myself, my kids are now in their 20s. Uh, this generation coming up has a lot on their shoulders, and there's a lot of, lot of concern about that. A um, lot of literature out there on youth, the youth mental health uh, crisis, and we can talk a little bit about that towards the end of the presentation. Um, and you can see that that actually, uh, that percentage actually came down from 2021. Again, I, I think that probably has something to do with the pandemic and being back at school, getting back to routines. Suicide. Um, during the past year, did you ever seriously consider attempting suicide? 19.4% uh, of our students did. It's less than at the middle school age, uh, but it is a little bit higher than the state average. This has been something that's been a passion of mine since I've worked for Greeley and something I care very deeply about. Um, and I always would love to see that number come down and work hard to make sure that it does. Um, we'll talk about some ideas a little bit later in the presentation as well. That number crept up a little bit from 2021, as you can see. Students getting help from an adult. Percentage of students who answered they got help from an adult. 37.4% in 2023 got help from an adult when they had a problem that they needed assistance with. 62% uh, said no, they did not. Um, and that has crept up from 2023. Three, actually, nope, that's the state average here. This is, not a, this is not a comparison between 23 and 21. The state average is 31%. So basically, more of our students in the state average would actually reach out for an adult to get assistance. It's still, to me, it still looks like a low number, <coughs> how hard many of our staff work, all our staff work, to really be trusted by kids and want to be um, uh, helpful. And I also think this is just not school. This is adults in, in a student's life. So um, something to be mindful of and to work towards. A little bit different format here. Um, uh, my colleague put this in, in this format, I think, to save you some slides, but I'll run it through it really quickly. I'll use my little handy dandy uh, magic pointer. If you look at the alcohol percentages here in 2021, um, by the way, past 30 day use, I'll start here at the top. That's an important number, as Eric pointed out. To me, what this means is that this would be students who are using something more regularly. There are questions on there. Have you ever had more than a sip or have had you just a sip of alcohol? This is, these are students who might be using these uh, substances regularly, which is probably um, the statistic that's more important for us to take a look at as, as many youth experiment. Um, but here at GHS in 2021, uh, about 22.2% um, used alcohol within the past 30 days, and that went down actually a little bit at the high school. I know it was a big concern at the middle school as it, as it did go up quite significantly. High school, it came down to 18.3%. Um, and actually, um, in 2021, that number is a little bit higher than the state average. Marijuana, we are jumping from 2021 at 14.4% of our students who used within the past 30 days to almost 20%, 19% of our students. Um, I, as Mr. Brown said, as Eric said, I believe that follows trends in our, in our larger um, communities and in our state and in our country. Um, and it has to do with accessibility and um, um, it becoming more acceptable uh, to, to use. And you can see that those numbers, like in 2023, our percentage is just slightly higher, but not significantly than the state average. If you look at prescription drug use, much smaller numbers, 2021, 3.6% of our students, and then 2023, 4.5. And go over to vaping which um, has been a, a big thing um, within the last 10 years. It's um, been a lot of things that have come and gone in, in that regard in terms of trends, but that still sticks for a certain core of our students. And you can see that in 2023, about 12% of our high school students are using vape uh, on a regular basis. And that's just basically a similar percentage to 2021. I actually think that's down from a few years ago when the whole jewel craze hit um, prior to the pandemic but that number slowly crept up again, um, which is unfortunate. And then this one uh, was interesting to me. I, I, don't, I can't really explain it, but it looks like in, uh, for cigarettes, we've historically always been lower than state average. As you can see in 2021, 3.5% um, of our students 
had used uh, cigarettes within the past 30 days. That was lower than the state average. And then if you sneak down here, you can see that that has crept up, 6.8%, uh, which is actually higher than the state average. In, in all the years I've been here, that's the first time I've seen that number creep up. It's definitely lower compared to alcohol and marijuana, but it is concerning nonetheless. Drugs on school property. During the past 12 months, has anyone offered, sold, or given you an illegal drug on school property? <laughs> and you can see in 2023, 16.7% of students had been offered, sold, or given illegal drugs on school property. Um, I don't know why this one came from 2017, but this was the, the two uh, my house is back, and you can see that the number has gone down. Maybe that's why Tiffany chose it. Um, you can see that that number has actually improved. And I, I can say, having been around the school, I do sense that that number has improved, and that's a nice thing to see. Um, that's, so that 16.7% over um, you know, more than a five-year period seems to have come down significantly. School climate and culture. Do you agree or disagree with the following statement? I feel safe at my school. And you can see here that almost 90% of our students feel safe at our school. Very cool. That's uh, higher than the state average. In 2021, it was close to 95% of our students felt safe at school. Again, higher than state average. Do you agree or disagree that at least one of your teachers really cares and gives you help and support when you need it? This one sort of speaks to the core of who we are at the school. And I'd always love to see this number come up. Um, I know we all work hard for it. So uh, about 74.2% strongly agree or agree that a teacher really cares and gives help. Um, that's a little bit below the state average. And then in 2021, you can see that similar, it's 71.6%. Again, just a little bit below the state average. School climate and culture. How often does your school enforce rules fairly? And 2023, 51.7% of our students felt that most of the time are always rules were enforced fairly. That's above the state average. And in 2021, you can see that that was 54.6%. Um, again, above the state average. Almost there. How often do adults in your school address conflict, negative language, and bullying in positive ways to help students? This number concerns me. It always has, and it doesn't seem to move all that much. Um, we are trying, and we will continue to be there. And I'd like to think that students who have worked with our administrators and the social workers, guidance counselors, and their teachers and families, that, um, that we all form a team to really try to make a positive impact on this. Um, so how often do adults in your school address conflict, um, bullying, positive ways? At GHS in 2023, it was 36.7% of the time. The state average was 31.5% of the time. So we're above state average there. And in 2021, we were again above state average with 42% of the time. So that fell a little bit, um, but not too much. Okay. And how often do you feel the people at your school care about students and encourage them? 50.8% uh, of, the of the time um, was, an was the answer in 2023, above the state average, and then again, above the state average in 2021 at 51.4%. Okay. So some positive highlights, um, and then Eric and I are gonna share the next couple slides after this. At the high school, majority of our students feel safe in our schools. The majority of our students don't use alcohol, marijuana, or prescription drugs. There was a decrease in reported alcohol use. There was a decrease in students reporting they have access drugs on school property. Less than one quarter of our students report vaping. Approximately half of our students report feeling they are treated fairly. More highlights. Approximately half our students reported feeling cared for and encouraged by us when they needed it. There was an increase in the amount of students reporting that they felt that at least one of their teachers cared about them and gave them support when they needed it, approximately three quarters of our students. And lastly, there was a significant increase in the amount of students who reported that they talked to an adult when they needed support. Areas of concern at the high school. There's an increase in past 30 day use of marijuana reported by our students. Again, I think this trends throughout our state. Approximately 16% of our students have been offered, sold, or given drugs in school property. That amounts to about 72 students. Again, that's a number that's fallen over the years, but it's still an area of concern for sure. Bullying remains a significant concern for our students. Depression and suicidality warrants our continued vigilance and scrutiny. 
While reported vaping at GHS is below state average, it's still happening. More than half of our students reported not connecting with an adult for help when they were feeling depressed. And less than half of our students reported feeling like conflict, native language, and bullying were addressed by adults in the school in a positive way. So Eric's presentation was blue, mine was greeley maroon. You can see in the highlights there we've combined. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that we have at the school that are protective factors. I'm gonna let Mr. Brown step in. and. Yeah, we've implemented a few things this school year. So Save Promise Club, which is uh, Students Against Violence Everywhere. It's a, it's a, it's, we have an adult um, um, advisor. I'm, I'm one of the advisors, Melissa Fowler's advisor in the high school. We have one for the GMS as well. And so basically it's a student-led um, um, club to help identify students that may be at risk of um, perpetrating violent acts. And, but, but it's mostly about connecting. It's about connecting peers, those peers that are sitting alone home or at lunch alone, trying to connect them up, trying to um, pinpoint students that may be kind of feeling left out. So it's really about an inclusion sort of piece. Uh, Sandy Hook Promise reporting app is an anonymous, anonymous reporting uh, application. If, if any other students notify or notice any signs, symptoms that a student's struggling, maybe said something, maybe reported something to them that they can anonymously uh, report it to this um, to this app, and that will get back to the uh, certain team, and we'll go ahead and check in on the student. Can I say something on that? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, yeah. so I, I just want so the Sandy Heck Promise reporting app really has just rolled out um, in the past couple of weeks. It's working. It is. it is working. There's been some really good things that have come in, and it's not just about what you think it is. It's about students who might really need help for some of these things you just heard about, about students who might be depressed, about students who might have a substance use issue, about a student who might be feeling suicidal. It's been very cool to see that work. So I'll just put that out there. And Kyle Kerr is, is another student-led, uh, again, adult advisor, uh, but student-led um, club as well, and that's about putting, decreasing the stigma of mental health, putting, um, uh, helping um, to, to work against self-harm, to work against suicide, anything like that. So it's a club to try to, more connections with students. Um, health classes, sixth, seventh, and eighth, Focus a lot on emotional health, focus a lot on substance use, um, 10th grade. Yeah, they have a health in 10th grade. We're gonna talk just a little bit more about that before we close up. Um, civil rights team here at the high school. We also have at the middle school level, uh, always important, a rainbow alliance and genders and sexuality alliance at the high school. Students who are LGBTQ plus are particularly high risk for depression and um, for suicidality. It's very important that we Embrace all our students, and um, uh-oh, something's going with the technology here. There we go, we're back. Social work positions, I have to say, and I think Mr. Brown would say, I am honored to be here at this school district. We've paid a lot of attention to students' social emotional needs, and we have staffed accordingly. I talked to some of my colleagues <coughs> when I'm out in the community, um, and particularly a year or two ago, I remember being at a statewide kind of conference on suicide prevention. Actually, Mr. Brown was nice. there with me. And Julie Olson was there. I was talking to people from all over the state. And as best I can tell, informally, we are in really good shape here in terms of how we're meeting need. And we did it at, at a good time. Particularly, a lot of that staffing grew over the pandemic. Um, it's been the growth matches the need. So it's been very, we're very lucky to have what we have. And we sort of listed out some of those positions that we have here. And then I'll just speak for Eric, and I'll let him take the rest of these. So the mental health specialist position, that's Eric Brown. And as a social worker who's based at, at the high school, Eric basically um, has been one of the saving graces of my position while, while the student mental health crisis has increased within the last 10 years. Um, it, the work has changed exponentially in terms of addressing suicide, suicidality and depression. To have Eric be able to come in uh, during a student's crucial moment of need, be able to assess the situation, give it particular scrutiny, come up with a plan, and then also what he might not talk a lot about is he helps me, he helps my colleagues case manage situations that require extra attention. So as a student needs that extra attention at that critical moment, they have the extra support in school, uh, which also allows me to still work with other students. Because a lot of times during a crisis moment, uh, one or two students can take up a lot of your time. So Eric's been very um, flexible and supportive in that way, and it's just been great to have him. It's, you know, it's been nice to see that position come into fruition. Thank you. 
And then just student support team, RTI process. Um, so SRSS screener is basically focusing on externalizing behaviors. Staff actually roll that out. Um, and, you know, any students that, the certain criteria, any students that meet that, they would, they would report it to administration, report it to social work. So identifying those students, and, and that goes all through uh, Mabel I, fourth, five, six, or eight, high school. We did that today at the high school. Rolled it out today. Yeah. Unified basketball, best buddies, club, so inclusion, uh, restorative practices, uh, primarily at GMS. This is, this, that's, that's huge there. Assemblies, so with specific focuses. Um, digital citizenship, and again, bullying uh, presentation. <coughs> ideas for consideration? Yep. Go ahead. Sure. Yep. So these are some ideas that we came up with. Um, previous boards have seen at least one or two of these and just put it out there. Um, and there are other districts that have this model, so there's something, something worthy in that. I think uh, right now, if you'll see students, if I'm correct, they're taking health most every year in middle school. They get to high school, they have it in 10th grade. So, and it, you can also see some of our numbers jump up, like think about alcohol and marijuana use jumps up from middle school to high school. So to me, that means we have a gap in ninth grade in particular, where we don't get that particular attention in that particular way. And I threw 12th grade in there too, because in suicide prevention and work, one thing I know is that the numbers of youth who die by suicide goes up after they graduate high school. They're entering a very risky time and becoming independent. Many of our students are heading off to colleges and needing um, some roadmaps and ideas about <coughs> seeking help for themselves and being self-advocates as they leave. And there are curriculums out there for that. So um, I'd ask the board to strongly consider that. Um, I, I know that that's been, there's been some conversation about that. Um, and I think, I think our health teacher in particular would, would uh, join me in that sentiment. Um, Evidence-based mental health and wellness prevention program. This uh, blues program actually came from the January issue of Scientific American. They had a, a study in there and an article about teen mental health in particular. This was an evidence-based program. It's basically six hours of classes that run in a certain segment of time um, that teach resilience, reduces low mood, and anxious thoughts. We didn't talk a lot about anxiety tonight, but um, just something to think about. There are other curriculums out there and we could integrate that into our classes. And I'll let uh, Eric finish up this slide. Oh, sure, yeah, so real quick. District-wide multidisciplinary substance abuse prevention program needs to be uniform across the, uh, the district, uh, district messaging and campaign for each building, and then just re-education for staff on students' social emotional health, safety procedures, and en enhanced reporting. So we've rolled a lot out in the last, I don't know, few years. <laughs> Um, and staff just need to be updated on those sort of things. So what are the signs, symptoms to look for in students that may be struggling? And what are the safe, safety procedures for reporting that? So, and thank you. All right. We're Appreciate your patience. Questions. That was a yeah, lot of information. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I know yes. that there's um, some other board members may have some questions about the result. Great, thank you. Sure, as I was telling you, Peter, as we were chatting in the, uh, in the hallway beginning, uh, I, I pay close attention myself to the essential programs and services model, uh, which is, is the baseline. And we, of course, have been spending over the years more than that for, and uh, the analysis that I developed myself for this budget year shows that one of the biggest areas of increase is in the student support. Three times uh, the essential programs Commitment is our, our allocation would be 955,000, and we're spending 3.3 million. I I think that's terrific personally. If we had to pick a spot to spend money over and above essential programs, student support would be the at least my choice of the of the first. So I I, I hope you feel in 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 the in the, in the schools that this this is an area of support for your work. Uh, yeah, I'll speak personally and, and have a little bit tonight. Thank you. Yes, um, and I do feel it. And, and as I artic articulated, I'm feeling it at the right time. I've, I've been a social worker for 30 years, and I don't know, probably about 25 of that or so have been in schools. And um, I've seen trends in mental health come and go and need, um, and nothing like, and I'm just using this as a general um, kind of time estimate, but the last 10 to 15 years, um, things have changed a lot, and uh, it's nice to see us meeting that. And 
I would hope that our model, um, particularly the model that includes our mental health specialist position, as I talked about, um, you know, Eric, Julie, and I had gone up to Augusta and presented this at this prevention conference with the hope that other districts would take a look at what we're doing and, and use us as a model to, uh, to replicate because it, it feels fair to the kids uh, and then it's, it's really an honor to be able to provide that level of help here. We're, we're very lucky and I appreciate the, that the board and um, our district has really planned for that. Yeah, not much to add to that, but thank you, Danny. So I'll try to, real b brief, but I worked, so I've been here since 2018. I worked at a major medical facility, uh, Southern Maine here for, for a few years before that. And the trajectory has been <coughs> increase in anxiety, increase in, increase in depression, suicidal ideation. So it's been on the rise since 2010. Um, and that correlates a lot with social media and, uh, but it's for this, that's what caught my attention for this job, is that, is the, is the risk assessment mental health specialist increase in mental health uh, supports, emotional supports in the district. And that's, that, that's really what caught my eye, is just um, helping to support uh, our students, so the young people. Just quickly, so thank you. Um, and also wondering if there's anything being considered for younger grades, um, you know, four or five currently together, um, and also, 11th grade, I know they have a lot going on in 11th grade, and I don't know if that's part of, or whether that would also be considered for expansion there. Yeah, so as far as the younger grades, they do, they start to, um, to delve in a little bit into um, uh, some of the, the substance use stuff, emotional health sort of stuff, so that's, that's definitely happening at a, a Mabel I level. Um, but also four through fifth is when they start introducing um, different substances, uh, particularly cigarettes, vaping, things like that. Um, so yeah, so that, um, that health education's happening and touched upon all those important, so healthy lifestyle cho choices. So that's, that's definitely happening in the younger grades as far as, yeah. I mean, I'm a strong supporter as far as, just to throw that out there, mm -hmm. is to offer more health classes, get them coming in to high school and get them going out of high school. I would absolutely support something like that. I'll say one, one thing. So um, two, I think two years ago now, uh, Casco Bay Can, which was an organization I, I was on the steering committee and actually helped uh, get that organization up and running many years ago, sort of uh, bit the dust, unfortunately. Um, it was a byproduct of COVID and really not being able to hire leadership that stuck. And the woman um, who made that really happen retired. Uh, that, that, you know, their, their uh, motto was talk early, talk often. It was all about working with younger um, grade levels and really work, working with parents on an education piece to help prevent because we need that kind of partnership. So there's a gap there right now um, worth looking at and certainly worth um, seeing what the community would like to do and joining with the schools on that because parents are such an important part of the equation. 11th grade, I'm into it. I think, I think a lot of it has to do with the budget. And like what, and, and also just knowing schools, it's like there's everybody here is very passionate about what they do, which is really kind of cool to see. If you go to any of our classrooms, you can see a passionate teacher. Um, no one is really in the business of trying to give up some of their time to make something else happen. So it has to do with, I think it has to do with time and money. Um, but yeah, I'd say 11th grade um, is, if we could, I think one of our suggestions was like taking a look across the curriculum multi, in multidisciplinary kind of way, which might not have a lot of cost to it, but what kind, of, um, what kind of lessons, what kind of lesson plan is going in that actually includes some of these subjects, um, and who's looking at that from the, from the top on down to make sure that the, that's happening at each grade level. Um, something to think about. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank you both. This was uh, excellent. Um, I also want to uh, commend you and your colleagues for doing such a great job of getting responses from students because this is a really, really valuable source of data um, and, and getting good, strong representation from our student body at, at two schools is, is really important. Um, so I do have one question and um, to, to frame this, uh, we're approaching the development of a new strategic plan and, and health and wellness has been a key part of our existing strategic plan. So looking forward to this next strategic planning exercise, if you were to treat what we've collected here and, and looked at as baseline data and you really wanted to move the needle on one thing, 
um, what was what would be that thing that you would pick that a few years from now you look back and say we were really su successful um, in improving this through this next strategic plan? Yeah, I, I, Mr. Brown, I probably have similar or different answers, but the thing that jumps to my mind, um, well, there's there's three things, but I'll encapsulate it in reducing the number of students who consider suicide in a given year. I think that 20% number is unacceptable and very sad. Um, and unfortunately, I've gained a very nuanced understanding of what that looks like across the board. Of course, every individual is an individual, has their own story and reasons. But that's the number I would love to see go down. I'd love to see us be significantly below the state average on that. That would be amazing. Um, it hasn't happened yet. We're we'll continuing to work on it. Yeah, I mean, there's not much, not much more to add. That's, that's the one that I would absolutely like to focus on. But just overall mental, emotional health, right? Putting that emphasis on that. And that's happening a lot right now. We're putting for each, so it's 6 through 12. We have advisory courses, and we're doing more social, emotional learning within those advisory courses. So we're doing, doing a lot of mental health focus, doing a lot of emotional health focus. And that's the foundation of everything. Good mental and emotional health leads to better grades leads to better connections with your peers, uh, leads to lower suicide rates, lower depression rates, lower anxiety rates. So yeah, I think it's an emphasis that we've been putting on and I'd love to see it continue. Thank you, Beth. Any, any other questions? Great, I don't have a question. I just wanna say thank you. And mm -hmm. I think presenting this in such a data-driven way is fantastic and speaks to so many people, I think, in our community. Um, so thank you for putting this together, and I would be happy as a board member to consider your ideas for consideration, particularly um, anything that reduces anxiety, because I agree with you, those numbers, as a healthcare <coughs> provider, what I've seen in the last eight years is that those numbers have just skyrocketed. So really grateful for this and for you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. While we're transitioning, I, I just want to say that um, Eric and Peter are, are amazing resources for our community, along with all of our other social workers and counselors in our schools. Um, our mental health, um, we do have good mental health supports, but it's also as good as our people. Um, and so thank you uh, for your representation of all of our social workers and counselors. Um, I'm really proud of what the staff that we have here. And, and um, so thank you for Putting all this information out is very important. We've worked very hard over the last few years, our staff has, in continuing to focus on this area. Mm -hmm. And thank seeing you. what we do with the data is awesome, so thank you. Thank you for your support. Appreciate Great. it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we have one item for action on the agenda tonight, um, which is a very important one, to set a referendum date for the proposed school project. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd... Um, I'd like to take the opportunity after a lot of discussion and thought over the last couple of weeks um, to make a motion to amend the 318-24 approved school plan with a project budget of 53,492,000 by providing an option for 3 million less, which excludes the turf field. Um, is there a second? Hearing no second to exclude the turf field. Okay. Um, I would like to ask for a, another motion for the items for action. Was there a second? No, there was no second. There is a budget, a public hearing on the school budget, which is separate from the referendum. Yep. Okay. Um, w would somebody like to read the motion for the recommended vote? I'll do that. I move that the warrant and notice of election of Maine School Administrative District Number 51 presented to the meeting be approved and that the referendum election for the district be called for June 11th, 2024 for the purposes of approving the issuance of bonds or notes of the district for school construction project purposes as described therein. 
Further, that the notice of public hearing presented to the meeting be approved and that a public hearing of the issuance of bonds or notes for school construction project purposes be held on May 20th, 2024 at 6 o'clock p.m. as provided therein. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. So I will open the discussion on the recommended vote. I'll go first. Great. So I want to start with saying the focus of this topic has been called the new school, the new elementary school, which I think is appropriate because that is the majority of the cost and the whole focus. However, I think it's been a disservice to the public and ourselves to call it that because in the reality, we're the school board for the whole school, not just the elementary school, but for all the students. And there are a lot of needs, as we all know, everybody knows there's a lot of needs all the time, maintenance, improvement for the whole school community, not just Mabel I. Wilson, not just elementary kids, important as they are. So, on the facilities committee, we've been very aware, and long before I landed on that committee, of a long list of items. The turf field as such, artificial field, whatever you want to call it, is not new. It's been on that list over 10 years, I checked, long before I imagined being on the school board. So it's not a new suddenly showed up item. I just want to be really clear about that. So I want to make a couple comments um, in general. First, regarding the health and safety of a turf field. I have evolved in my understanding. I think all the board members know from last year as well, I was not in favor of a turf field. I was very concerned about the health, the safety of it. It started with my own son's experience, which when I counted back is about a dozen years ago now, on a unnamed school nearby their turf field. And he got a very small cut, which within less than 18 hours became a very serious emergency room. Cut is very small little cut. But it had become infected and it was spreading like spider veins and that's the kind you know you get to the ambulance, the emergency room right away. So that was my experience and my view of what are these turf field things. So since then, my view has been negative about turf fields. And I would Google now and then, especially in the last year, artificial turf. And when I Google it, many things come up. And the internet, it's kind of weird to me. They don't always say exactly what year, what date they're referencing that article or that research, whatever. And whether it's what kind of research it is. So I had to sort of keep looking at it again and again and again until I, I finally started noticing that the more recent turf fields are, are different. They're not the crumb rubber. Well, they're still out there, the crumb rubber fields. But there are other materials that newer research is showing is non-PFAS, which is better, it's improved. The PFAS and the board itself has said this several times, certainly we've said it in the facilities meeting and Mr. Blatt, the architect has acknowledged we've said this, we don't want PFAS, it, we want a non-PFAS material. So for myself that's not an argument, there's no argument with me, I don't want a PFAS field. The infill is really important. But again, when you Google it, you, you come up with all sorts of alarming, to me too, reports on health and everything. But when you start really looking at it, it's from the earlier fields, the kind my son got injured on. So my own thinking has evolved. I completely understand the health concerns, but I am not as concerned. There's a second thing that causes health problems on these fields, and it's drainage. If the fields are not um, properly um, set up underneath the infill if they're not properly drained, uh, yeah, you're going to get mold, bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. 
I, I have a lot of faith in the Blatt Associates. They've done a lot of work on the campus over the years. And I feel, um, I myself, I haven't heard about flooding or damage on the campus or neighbors, even in all these massive storms we've been having. So I think, for myself, I, I trust they know what they're doing with the drainage. Injuries also occur. Big concern, I understand that. Um, athletes themselves get injured on all fields, but I've heard about the injuries, the field is faster, et cetera. My understanding is there's different different fields you can you can purchase the material there's different blade lengths for different sports there's ones that will work for many different sports but regardless there has to be training of the coaches and the students it's it's like when i first learned how to play tennis way back when and there were only um, courts that were clay and when i started playing on hard courts i got injured because nobody told me how to move differently and I couldn't go back and forth between them so it, it's it's not the same but it's similar to that we all have to learn how to play on different surfaces with a different kind of racket the wood racket I still prefer but okay it's too heavy I use the others there's there's adjustments that need to be made that very deliberately the coaches need to and we need to fund the coaches so they can do that sort of training and the students need to be open to it there may be things we say, like, you, you need to wash up afterwards, regardless of whatever that material is, whether it's even a natural grass field, they should be washing up more. Last thing on the health and safety I want to say is just the current field we have, the grass field, I think there's an illusion we all kid ourselves. It's grass, it's natural. I don't know, think about all the weeds, all the dandelions in the field, in Hutchins Field. Or don't, because there aren't many, because the pesticides have been poured on there for years. It's not natural. It's not necessarily safe for our kids. So I don't think that argument that natural grass is um, valid as a concern. So next topic. Um, sorry to hog. I'll give you guys time. <laughs> Okay, so regarding need versus want, I have also evolved. I also began with, this is a want. They're saying they want this. The neighbors have it. The kids want this. Of course they want it. Who doesn't want? I, I've, I've listened to all sides, the emails, the, uh, the students, the teams, the coaches. I'm really concerned as a mom, one of my... One of my terrors, and I'm sure I've shared it, I'm sure I share it with others who are parents, that having your teenager drive late at night is not something you want to experience, especially when they're tired, when they've practiced, and, you know, it's winter sometimes when they're driving. That's, that's an accident waiting to happen. And the rental turf fields the students are going to they're in Lewiston, Auburn. They're in Biddeford. They're in Saco. As a mom, that's terrifying to me. I did not know that. I didn't know that many nights during the week students are traveling like that. The school's not paying for that. The parents are. I'm sure it's getting expensive, and at some point they may ask the schools to pay for those rental. So that, that's a concern. It's a huge concern for me the students are traveling like that even though we have really good driving ed teachers in our district, I know that, but regardless, that's uh, frightening and, and a safety hazard. The other thing I did not know is that many colleges our students are applying to, going to, if they want to seek an athletic scholarship, they need to show footage on a turf field. They're not legally allowed to do that footage on an opponent's team so they're pretty much left without any footage they can apply. So that it, it hugely disadvantages them. So that's a bummer. It's only two pages, don't worry. So my feeling is it's our responsibility as a board to help out all the students and provide for their needs the maintenance and the cost of traditional fields 
referencing the cost of this. That alone um, is, a, is a lot more than it used to be. We have these relentless downpours. The climate's changing. We all know that. That's a huge cost that may be hidden and people don't realize the fields that they used to play on when they graduated from here, whenever it was, even 10 years ago, it's not the same fields. There are new needs that the athletes have. So in summary, uh, all this has led me to be in support of a turf field. I wasn't in this place a year ago, and I wasn't even last September when I became the facilities chair. It was not my intent to support a turf field. But I have learned a lot. I know they're not perfect. I don't think they're wants. I think they're needs. And I think that we need to help all the students. We're not an elementary school board. There's a huge list of items we have to address for the whole school. And I think that we could do it with this referendum. I think we could get a new elementary school, and I think we could get a safe non-PFAS new athletic field, and I think they're both needed. So thank you for hogging the time, but thank you for your attention. Pan, you're up then. Um, so uh, thank you. I want to first of all thank for everyone that responded um, this weekend. and. Hopefully, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of uh, my comments here too, and hopefully, in the in the spirit of the Ken Wee presentation, um, and assuming positive intent with everybody. So, I know we've all put a lot of thought into this, and your responses to me have been an indicator of that. Um, but I still, I can't help but feel like you didn't listen to the motion, because the arguments continue to be about the turf field versus not the turf field. I'm not arguing for turf fields or not. I'm arguing for separating it out. Um, so for public knowledge, late last week, I wrote the board an email requesting that we make the amendment um, that I just made to this referendum language. So to anyone that wants to see that email, I'll be happy to share it. In summary, I believe that we should separate it for the following reasons. Turf has a controversial history of failed attempts. I understand the great emotion tied to it, but it takes energy from the core part of this project, which makes it harder for us to share and discuss the really important aspects of this proposal. This isn't just in public. We experienced this during the tri-council meeting earlier, um, I guess in the winter, uh, when the majority of questions that we got were about the turf and not about the actual school building. As a board collectively, here's the second reason, we haven't reviewed quotes safety and other options for fixing um, or other options like fixing the grass field as is and getting this information to the public to secure a vote takes time and energy away from our greatest and most pressing issue our solution to overcrowding that brings me to the third reason this field is not essential to solving our enrollment issue or impacted by current construction plans it provides space mostly for high school and middle school which christina just kind of laid out but which is why I believe we didn't include it in the 80 Gray Road initially. Perhaps most importantly, the fourth reason, based on feedback from the community and what I've been hearing, it's been overwhelmingly negative towards the turf field. And so I believe we are decreasing the likelihood of the school passing. So I want to be really clear that my argument is not about a turf field. I understand the desire for a new field. I agree with what Christina just said. The kids shouldn't be going to practice at 9 to 10 o'clock at night. We should be providing our students with a safe and reliable playing surface. That makes sense. But for just 2% of the entire cost, it seems worth it, right? OK, but are we willing to lose more than the most important 98% when there is an option to have the insurance for it? Here are the reasons I can figure. You think the turf field will lose by itself, and it's a good opportunity to get something you've wanted for a while. If that's the case, logically it shows a school is not worth doing unless it has a turf field. I'm not sure any of us believe that, but that's what our current proposal reflects. The second reason is you think it's so popular that it will help the school pass. Check Facebook, sit on one of these Q&A tables the engagement committee's been doing, read your emails. 
I spoke with one teacher at Mabel I. Wilson recently who begged me to put in the two options because she was worried we'd lose the school, that once again the needs of our elementary school would be sacrificed for the needs of our high school, who would primarily benefit from this. I don't have any official numbers to tell you, but I think the, the eye test would show that the nays have this one. And third, there may be a sense that if the board reverses course that we somehow are showing weakness, that we can't let some group win. Our reasons shouldn't be personal and we can't get defensive because people, regardless of how they align with them on this issue, notice something we put in and that we even questioned when it first came in. And I think we've shown as a committee that when we've listened to our community, when we've allowed their feedback to build buy-in, we've done better. And that's what we've gotten out of this, <laughs> this uh, elementary school plan on campus. And so the last reason is the belief that people, that this is the right thing to do because it provides a little something for all stakeholders. And I do understand this argument with Christina was just making, I, I do understand that. But if the turf field is such a win, why can't it pass on its own? Why is it more right than expanding the MIW gym, given that the building that's, that's the building that's most tasked and currently can't even fit all of its students for an assembly? Or a plethora of other needs that we have? So I'm still a yes on this proposal, um, and I appreciate the space, <coughs> but I, I do hope that we know what we're putting at risk here, what we've worked all year for right that and it's it's not even just taking the turf off it's not school versus turf it's just giving people the option to vote something they're most comfortable with for something that is technically not related to what we are what we came out proposing we would do so that's where i'm at that's why i made the motion that i did i'm surprised that no one even wanted to discuss it given the feedback that i've gotten um but um, that's why, like, you know, I support the school, but I have to be a no on, on the way that we've gone about this um, and have, are failing, I think, to listen to the community and giving ourselves the best chance to get the school, which my kids, my kids, are most impacted at. So um, thanks for the time. I, I know it's an emotional space for all of us, including me, but, um, but that's where I'm at. I, I just do want to respond to that. And I mean, I wrote this in my email to you, Tim. I, I don't disagree with anything that, that you've said. And maybe we're hearing from different portions of the community. I've completely tuned out Facebook. I can't just, it is not a productive um, outlet for me. Um, so I know what I've heard from sitting here at these meetings. And I recall two weeks ago having several dozen students, coaches, parents, all talking about how this would have such a meaningful difference to, to their experience um, versus, I don't know, a handful of people who have spoken out against this. Uh, and of course, we've received emails from community members on, on both sides of this. Um, so I, I find it difficult to have a real gauge of whether we're listening to people or not, because I'm hearing from lots of people who are very much in favor of this. Um, to me, it really comes back to the fact that we are failing our student athletes because we're not giving them a place that they can practice. We're shipping them off to Portland or Auburn um, at, and from, for practices from 9 p.m. to 10.30 p.m., which I think is completely unacceptable and a huge safety issue. Um, what we're presenting is a, a project to improve our campus in a, in a multitude of ways. The school is one part of that field is one part of that. Um, updates to the high school and Mabel I. Wilson um, are all part of that. It's really frustrating to me that we've spent so much time and energy talking about a field. And personally, I don't care if we put in a new grass field, just as long as it's a field that, we, that our, our kids can use. Unfortunately, a new natural grass field will present many of the same challenges that our existing field does. We would need several fields to be able to get the usage that we would get from an artificial um, surface. Um, but we need to do something to, to rectify this issue. And I'm sorry that it's become such a, a, a lightning rod of, of an issue. But I think what we're presenting is a solution that solves many of the um, things that we've identified in our long-term campus, um, campus plan. 
And I, I think it's, it's really unfair to highlight this one thing um, that we're going to pull out and, and treat it differently. So that, that's just that's my, my perspective on it. I, I think you've made some, some really valid points. Um, but ultimately, I, I'm, I'm very much in favor of the, the, what's been proposed. Okay, go ahead. I don't know that I'll have too much productive to add, um, but um, I certainly at this point am seeing this as making uh, the necessary improvements to make the one campus function. Um, and I also struggled with this over time. Um, I think the turf field probably first came on my radar before COVID when the one campus model was being considered the first time um, and I was serving on PTO at that time and knew that that was something that was being looked at and that um, at least the folks in the community who I was speaking with at that point were supportive of seeing uh, included in the package. So, you know, and then I think for many of us when Aaron Rodgers was injured at the beginning of the football season, it brought up some more questions or maybe there were other examples for other people um, that started to bring up questions about the health and safety um, of the fields. And so I certainly, as we've continued through this process, been a big proponent of making sure that we are using that language of PFAS free, um, recyclable, alternative infill. Um, I really think that that's important that we see that through as a board. Um, and I think that everyone has been on board with that and committed to that. And I've been pleased to see that. Um, the folks no who I've been speaking with in the community. There's no place to recycle it in the country. It's a fact. Your facts are wrong. I'm, I'm no sorry. I'm sorry. You'll have to be removed from the meeting if you can't respect Terrific. the meeting rules. Thank you. Um, and I, I guess, you know, as I've been thinking about this too and talking with other people in the community, I have seen changes of, of opinion when people have heard the discussions that have happened um, on this board over time, not just tonight, but the last couple evenings when this has been maybe more of a focus of conversation than we would have liked, um, but just understanding the need for it based on the usage, um, understanding the commitments of the board in terms of addressing those um, health and safety concerns. I think, you know, to Tom's point a little bit too, any grass field that we were able to put in or make better is never going to be an NFL grass field. Um, I think that we are going to have other injury factors involved for our players because we, you know, frankly, as a school district cannot maintain a field in the same way that the NFL might be able to. Um, so that's a concern. And then I think just the use with dominant times for us being spring and fall when we are seeing increased rainfall um, and those kind of things as well. I do understand that cost is a concern for folks. Um, and I think that, you know, there's probably going to be some other parts of the proposal that we'll also hear about. And, you know, the turf field has become um, the focus for now, but I think that overall it is uh, a package that makes those improvements to, to really make this sustainable for all of our students and for those students for whom we're building the school for who will then be coming up through our middle school and through our high school. Um, I do see it as a need that has been long unaddressed and takes into account our outdoor space as well as our indoor space. Um, I guess the other piece that I would just mention is, um, you know, we did hear about mental health of our students, sense of belonging. I think that um, physical activity, physical education, participation in sports is a really good protective factor that we also want to continue to to encourage. And by creating a place on our campus where students can engage more in that physical activity and not having to go off campus um, makes a lot of sense to me. So. Thank you. So you actually, um, as happens so often, um, hit on something that I'll springboard off of, which is the idea that there are kids who don't play sports right now because they don't have a ride to practice. Um, that is a small piece of this, but just to, to affirm what you are saying, it, it does open up more opportunities if kids can't afford to, um, spend that money on um, the rental of a 
of it, what I have to believe is probably a less safe turf field than what we're going to be providing um, in this, uh, or they don't have a ride, and, and that does create some inequity there. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, Tim, I want to speak specifically to um, to a point that you made that I that I have heard. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I have been wrestling and grappling with this since our March fourth meeting. This has been a really difficult uh, decision for me. Did not come to this lately. Um, the idea of why wasn't this in the original package? If this was such a big deal, why didn't why wasn't this addressed before? Simply because the cost of building the new school was prohibitive. Um, it's my understanding that, I mean, certainly with 80 Gray Road, there was no possible way we were going to be able to improve the existing campus other than some things that would need, be needed to, do, needed to be done to Mabel Wilson to make it a school for um, third, fourth, and fifth graders. Other than that, there are a lot of problems on the campus that were not going to get addressed. Um, and it's also my understanding that the 80 Gray Road had space for recreational fields, which I have to believe we would have, um, if we ever even got to that point, would have entertained the idea of building turf fields. Um, that's, that's more my conjecture. Uh, going back further, the on-campus plan involved moving the superintendent's building, involved um, you know so much going on there that a turf field could not have been considered. So I, I have heard um, from other people that this represents us being greedy and asking for more than we should have. And I understand, I, I do understand how it can look that way. I have come to the belief that we are, we see this opportunity because this new school is so much less this project, I should say, is so much less, it does afford us the op opportunity to address other issues that have been there for so long, like the maintenance shed, like the traffic um, issue on campus. So I shifted my thinking to, okay, we now have an opportunity to not only focus on a new school, but to look at these other areas that have been an issue for over a decade. Um, so I feel comfortable making this a sustainable campus proposal. Um, and I have also heard that, that, um, that that's a bait and switch, that we are going from a new school to a campus proposal. Well, we've had to change this course of direction many, many times. So I don't feel that it is wrong for us to change our focus of what the referendum should be because we have this newer opportunity to do it. So um, I guess everybody please know that this is not something that we just said, oh great, we can, we can add a turf field. Um, I, if I look at emails, conversations I have had and people who have come to meetings and spoken, not Facebook conversation, those other things, it's 70, 30 people in favor of keeping the turf field in. Um, I, ha I have to consider that there are more taxpayers, that doesn't even include the students who have spoken, there are more taxpayers who have communicated to us through the channels that we have created um, that they would prefer that this stay in the referendum because they do see that this is an opportunity to fix multiple issues on our campus. So that, that is why I did not feel um, that the motion uh, should be entertained. Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and the motion as I heard it too, to be, to be honest, Tim, was just to remove it. I didn't actually I think the hear to the, the part that you had mentioned in your email, but that's just what I had heard during today's meeting. Um, were there other people who would like to make additional comments of, of I would during this time great thanks Megan um, Tim thanks for your email and for your thoughtfulness I, I appreciate it when I looked back on it and thought about it over the weekend 
what I came back to was that I think this is a good plan. I think the one campus plan is a really good plan. I'm proud of this plan. I'm proud of the school that's being proposed. I think it's fantastic. I'm proud that we're gonna tackle some of the traffic issues on campus, which are bad right now and would be much worse with more kids and more people in the configuration that we're proposing. So I'm glad that we're tackling that. That's a big part of this too. I'm glad that we're looking at Mabel I. Wilson, which needs some serious love. I think this is a good plan, and I think it's a good plan with the turf field. And the thing that sold me on turf that I don't know that a lot of people in the community are hearing unless they're at these meetings or they're having conversations with us is that we've got tons of athletes who are driving to other turf fields. I saw one of our juniors um, earlier today, and he said, oh yeah, tonight I drive to the MAC at 9 for a practice from 9 to 10.30. We usually go till 10.45. I'm home like around 11.10 and then I have another dinner and then I'm in bed maybe by 11.45. And this is night after night for him. They're practicing multiple nights a week. And he's not the only one. He's on a team with others. He's not the only team that's doing this. There are multiple teenage athletes that are driving from our community to Augusta sometimes, to Portland, to other places to use turf. That feels really unsafe and really, really unfair to ask of those kids and the parents and the guardians that are responsible for those kids. That's not, not okay with me. That feels terrible. I also was sold um, by the idea that the kids get so much less time playing on the field as it is. When um, Mr. Shapiro pulled up this spreadsheet that sort of showed how much time kids practice and play on the field versus how much time kids could practice and play on the field, there was a big difference, a huge difference. And it was across multiple teams for boys and girls. And that's a big deal. I don't think that we should deny our athletes the ability to play and practice here. There are other teams that talked about the fact that they practice in the parking lot. That presents major health problems too. Yes, turf fields are fast and hard, but the gravel parking lot at Twinbrooks is not a safe place to practice. That's just not okay. So is the turf field perfect? No, no, there are some problems. There are maybe more orthopedic problems and happily we know about these problems um, and we can train and condition our athletes to help prevent some of these problems. And that's an area that we actually do know a lot about. There's a lot of science behind that. Um, can we commit to a safer PFAS field? Well, yes, I think we're all saying that that's exactly what we want to do and that we will do our best. We will ask our builders to do their best in choosing the right field. Can I say to you that in 10 years we won't say, oh, we learned something about this field that it's maybe not totally perfect? No, because we're constantly learning every moment about the environment in which we live. We're learning every day about chemicals that we're exposed to that we think are safe, but now we're learning that maybe they are absorbed, et cetera, et cetera. So can we say that we're gonna do our best job? Yes, absolutely. Um, can I say to you it's 100% perfect? No, I cannot, but we can commit to doing the best that we can do to avoid these problems like our kids driving around late at night and playing in a parking lot. Um, so I think our plan is a really, really good one. I like it. Then there are people who are not gonna be happy with us. And our, what I've realized through this is that we're not gonna please everybody in our communities all the time. Maybe if it's not the turf, then maybe somebody will say, well, did you really need the extra half acre? Or do we really need to add four classrooms onto Nibli? I think that there are potentially you know, problems for certain people in our community with any plan. But I think this is a plan that we can get behind. I think it's a really good plan and we need it. Our kids are crammed into portables and it is time to move forward with a good solid plan, which I think this really is. Is there any Sophia? So Tim, I think you've made some really, really good points and I feel like they've been really valuable to me and they've really made me think about, I mean, as a student, I've always felt pro-turf, but I think what you pointed out really made me consider like the consequences of what might happen if we put the two together. But I feel like for me, it really comes down to my role as a student representative. And from not hearing a single student, which of course is a very biased viewpoint, 
but none of them have felt opposed to a turf field, even the kids who don't play sports. So I just feel like as a student representative, it's my duty <laughs> to be in favor of them together because it presents it as a necessity, which I think is the real kind of question which a lot of the, both of the towns are considering about whether or not it's a necessity, so. Um, yes, and I wanted to thank you as, as well, Tim. I've been, you know, I share a lot of the same concerns that you've outlined, and I did not intend for the last, I don't know how many months um, to, instead of being talking about a new school, to be talking about turf. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that that's where we are at again with this conversation, but I think what we really should be focusing on is how incredible of an opportunity that we have on this campus. And I've never really seen a school project that doesn't also include work on um, surrounding fields and other supporting space. Um, so now that we're looking on campus, we're trying to address the things that have um, I don't want to use the word neglected because we've certainly done, <laughs> I, f I feel like using that word um, makes it sound like uh, we, as a board and as administrators, haven't been taking care of our things. We've done a really good job at taking care of our facilities. Um, I think when we, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is like around the debt service and, you know, what percentage of our overall budget, and it's actually pretty low. So we've been pretty fiscally responsible in that way, but one of the things that I felt like I was asked to do when looking at the direction to go with this this new school project is also to look at the, the list of things that have, have been not put out or in um, part of referendums or bonds um, that needed to be addressed um, because of whether it's either having place for our students and student athletes to be able to, to play on campus or addressing traffic <laughs> issues or needing a, a, a facilities building. Like there's things that um, hadn't been addressed and to have the ability to have some vision on what we want this campus to be and look like um, and having usable space on campus. Again, turf or not, um, there needs to be part of the budget that is allowing for space on campus. and. Anybody I know who's asked any of the board members, we are committed to ensuring that there is, um, you know, PFAS free and other alternatives to address the environmental and safety concerns. Every member of this board shares those concerns. And that once, you know, we're putting forward a budget to be approved. What happens after the community, hopefully, approves that budget is we have a building committee, we have, we bring in experts to help recommend um, what we want the materials to look, to look like. We put together bid packages that outline the things that we expect our vendors to be using as far as materials. We put environmental representatives on our committees to ensure that our, you know, we're able to meet our, um, climate goals and environmental goals with this project. So we needed a budget to put forward with a vision for what this campus should and could look like for our students and our community that we could be proud of. And so what we do from there involves a whole other layer of input. Um, and so again, this is not what I intended to be talking about. Um, I tended to be focusing on the incredible school and campus facility that we're able to offer our community through this budget at what we think is, I know when you're talking millions, it doesn't feel reasonable, but I know looking down the 80 plus million that the Gray Road Project became, um, working hard to get that back down and then not addressing anything on campus felt irresponsible. And so I, f I feel that for me, this is a responsible budget that addresses a whole set of, of needs on our campus. Um, for for all of our students and listening 
to our community members. Um, and I know it's not going to, it's not going to please everyone. Um, but I hope it feels that we can be proud and feel responsible. Christina, you look like you want to say something. I do. I guess I want to reiterate what you said that I feel that again, it's millions we're talking about. So that's crazy. But I think we should all feel very um, celebratory in many ways because for those of you who weren't on the board um, last year, or whatever, um, we were at 80 million and it was huge. And we went down to 74.6 and that was, it went down, but that was still high and we got the message that was way too much. And we're at 53 million, that's huge. I'm, I'm surprised people aren't jumping for joy, honest to God, if not on the board, but in the public, like you are giving us all this for this. Agreed, not everyone's gonna like everything that's in it. But I don't know any other communities that have pulled that off to offer something so much more reasonable uh, and responsible. So thank you to all my fellow board members and the public that have supported us and all the questions, but um, 53 from 80, folks. Um, some smiles or cheers or something, please, because I think it's incredible. I, I really think our, do. I think our new, I think the new plan is something to celebrate. I really do. I think what we've done in the last couple months is something really great to celebrate. But I, I do think that when we say down to the 53 million, which I think is much lower, I think the taxpayers would be much happier than, with that. I, I really, I was on the other side of this, um, but I, I don't know how much credit we should be taking for that and patting ourselves on the back. I think us listening to the voters, going back to the drawing board, doing our due diligence for the, um, taking the advantage of the land that we bought, passing that, I think that's great. But it, it's really the, the voters that brought us to this level to make us reconsider. We voted for 80 Gray Road in the fall again. But then we did the right thing by doing due diligence and coming back. So I hear you, Christina. I think we should be celebrating. I think we should be celebrating with the town. But I, I, I do want to be careful to make sure that we hit that messaging well, is that like, like we're really appreciative of the voters bringing us to where we got to, because I think we do have a better product because of them um, and the trust in that. So um, I hear you. I don't mean to undermine that at all. But I, I, I have heard feedback of that from us and the board. Have we, haven't, have we, we keep celebrating that and patting ourselves on the back, and I, I just don't think it, it sits well. So um, um, I just want us to be conscious of that. I, I would say I'm conscious of that. I'm not I'm patting myself on the back. No, I hear you. I'm, I'm saying, saying it comes off we have that. done a lot of work, and people need to hear that, and we need to... Just be clear, this, a lot of communities don't have boards that have been able to pull this off. So yes, thank you voters for pushing us. And thank yes, thank the rest of us for, for putting in a lot of hours to get here. Mm -hmm. So let's move forward, everybody, voters and board. We've got a proposal mm -hmm. for 53 million. Yeah. So let's do this. And to be clear, pulling it off means our voters vote for it. So I'm hoping that is the position that, with this solid um, plan, that addresses <coughs> the concerns um, and the questions that have come in since the original. Is there any, I, I'd like to move to a vote unless there's anybody else who'd like to, to comment. So all in favor of um, the motion on the floor for the referendum? What was the motion again? Um, sorry, your computer's open and mine went to sleep. So the recommended vote is that the warrant and notice of election of Main School Administrative District number 51 presented to the meeting be approved and that the referendum election for the district be called for June 11th, 2024 for the purpose of approving the issuance of bonds or notes of the district for school construction project purposes as described therein. Further, that the notice of public hearing presented to the meeting be approved and that a public hearing of the issuance of bonds or notes for school construction pro project purposes to be held on May 20th, 2024 at 6 p.m. is provided therein. And so I called for the vote. 
In, in layman's terms, we're oh, setting sorry. the date. Setting the date. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're setting the date. Date for the referendum. Thank right. you. Yeah. All right. All in favor? All opposed? Thank you. I'm a little bit confused because there was two different votes. I just want to make sure that we just voted on the motion on the floor. The main motion. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it was a unanimous. It was unanimous. Vote. Okay. I just want to make sure. <clears throat> Thank you. So, signatures, Jeff. Do you want me to? Yeah. So uh, now that the board has voted to send this to referendum, um, we have paperwork um, just before the meeting ends. We just got to make sure that everybody signs. Um, these all have to be signed by each board member. Uh, and so I would suggest doing that prior to the executive session. Um, going into executive session would be my suggestion to do that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So now I believe, sorry, my computer fell asleep. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I left my agenda on the printer. So now we're going to move to the public hearing uh, with the beginning with a presentation on the school budget. We don't, we don't have a presentation. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> that comes next meeting. The next meeting. So now is. <laughs> I was like, oops, <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> okay. So for the public hearing on, on the budget, then we. This is just a public hearing. It's just a public. That wants to okay. Are there any questions? If there's any questions on the budget. Uh, yes. <laughs> And I know you were here earlier. I think the same rules apply. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you got it. Okay. My timer here. I, yes. Uh, I think we'll have to bring the timer back up. <laughs> okay. I didn't prepare a speech here, so I'm going to wing it here. Uh, I'm Andrew Baca. I live at 325 Main Street in Cumberland. I also teach here at the high school. Uh, I'm a science teacher. Uh, I... I want to thank you guys for all the work you're doing here. It's, I know it's very, very tough work. Uh, we had some heavy, first I have to say, I, mean, I know I'm limited on time here, but I really, I really like uh, Andrew, the presentation earlier. I'm really a big fan of Mr. Scott, too. Uh, I moved here to Cumberland in, about 26 <laughs> years ago because my wife just had a baby, and we decided we wanted to move to uh, MSA D51. We were a big fan of this area. This is where we wanted our kid to go to school. Uh, so, and when I started teaching, I changed careers. I started teaching about 15 years ago, and my goal was to teach here at Greeley High School. Um, I used to, when I taught at Edward Little, I used to take a day off to come here to judge the science fair projects, because I thought the science fair projects were so cool. So that was my day off. Um, I'm coming today to talk about the budget. I'm a little bit concerned about the science department, and, and part of that is we have a, a teacher retiring this year, and they've decided not to refill her position. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have the numbers. I thought somebody else was going to come here tonight with the numbers. But um, when I first started teaching here, we didn't have the block schedule. We had a different schedule. And so I don't know what the minutes were, but like say you had 100 minutes of English class each week, you'd have 120 minutes of science class. Science classes were a little longer because we had labs that we had to do. Uh, when we went to block scheduling, science department lost minute times with their kids. Uh, and because of that, we lost science fair. We don't do science fair anymore. Uh, because just wasn't enough time to cover the material and do it. And I, that was a, a real big, big letdown for the whole science department because we really, really enjoyed it. I think it was a good thing for the kids to do science fair. Um, since then, I think we're losing this teacher. I think we've lost another science teacher uh, position. Uh, and um, I just want to make sure everybody knows that there will be an impact. You know, whenever you decrease dollar, uh, it, it's going to affect things. I, I think that I have 78 students this year or somewhere around there plus my advisory and my study hall kids, I think I'm going to be increasing to about 30% 30, 30 next year in students. And uh, that affects the time I have to focus on helping kids. Uh, and it's not just the content, uh, uh, but it's all the things Mr. Scott was talking about. You know, I, we, I'm checking in on kids. I'm checking their grades. I'm making sure that they're okay. I'm seeing if they're being bullied. All these other things when my class has got, uh, it's full, the room is full, it's going to be harder to monitor those things. Uh, I taught at schools where that had full classrooms, so 20, 24 kids in them. Um, 
there becomes more behavioral problems. There's less time for teaching. There's, uh, there's more times where you're managing classrooms. And um, it's, it's, uh, it becomes a problem. And I'm worried about uh, the effect it will have on our students. Uh, having crowded, more crowded. They're not, you know, we will manage it. We will deal with it. But I'm just telling you, there will be effect, effects uh, uh, because of this. Ooh, that's it. Did I win a prize? All right, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and we did receive an email for a public comment that we had shared from, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, anyone else for public comment on the budget? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I just wanted to mention a few things on the budget. When, okay, when great. You'd like about the time, so. Sure. So, um, one of the things that we're still waiting on in the budget is our health insurance rates, and we got preliminary rates or received preliminary rates that mentioned that our rates could be anywhere from 1.5% to 11.5% as part of the whole MEA uh, Anthem Trust. So that's the range that we'll be in. Uh, if we budgeted 7%, um, we'll know by April 10th what our rate is. So sometime uh, before then what our actual rate is. About every percent on health insurance, it represents about $63,000. So, so that's what we'll have to look at when we get either way and when we get the rates. Um, I'm hoping for the rates to be less than seven. Uh, but we'll see what our experience rate looks like and where we land on that. So, so there may be some modifications to the budget depending on where we land on, on the health insurance. So, uh, and that's really one of the things that I wanted to mention. We're currently going through all of our salary lines and, and just double checking every, every line in terms of our salary. So, so there may be some minor adjustments there, but, um, but the budget right now is at, uh, you know, almost 4% in Cumberland and uh, just over 3% in North Yarmouth. So. Okay, uh, which Denny has reminded us uh, is uh, lower than inflation. So, is that is that a that was a like prompt? That was a prompt, Denny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just think you know, uh, I've worked with these numbers before, and, and and I've worked with Scott over the years. This is a really thrifty budget, and I think the community should understand that we we're coming off a time when inflation was six to eight percent. And we're presenting a budget here this year, which increases the mill rate, in, in effect, less than that. And, and uh, I, I, I'm very proud to be able to support this budget. I think it's extremely uh, prudent and, and efficient. So hats off to the staff that put it together. I attended a few of the meetings, and I thought they were very well covered. Hats off to the chair, who was a tough guy, I can tell you. So happy to support it. I mean, sure, go. Cool. Yeah. Uh, can, can we um, address Dr. Baca's concern? Um, how was that decided not to uh, add or to um, replace the retiring science teacher? Could that be done with a half position? Um, not that I want to add to the budget, but it's, it's a I good agree. point. Yeah, I'd love to know. So there's more two about criteria. That. Yeah. No, go ahead. I don't want to. I don't know if you're saying something, Megan. Uh, there's two criteria that we looked at. So we, we did a um, review of all the class sizes in the school district in the fall of 23, so this year, um, post-pandemic. We had added several teaching positions um, across the district, um, not necessarily the science department, <coughs> but um, across the district. So we did a review of all of our classes um, in our class sizes post-pandemic um, and wanted to make sure that we're still in line with with what our class size expectations are. So this budget includes three reductions of uh, teaching positions, two at the primary school level, where class sizes are at the smallest in a couple of areas, so we reduced two positions there. Um, and one at the high school with science. That's one criteria. The second one was attrition. We weren't going to riff anyone. That was the second criteria. Um, that we would do this through a natural attrition um, if there was a retirement or someone was leaving, we'd be looking at those positions. And I'm just going to say this out loud, and I know this is not popular, but if there is another retirement or a position that comes up at the high school in a different content area, we're going to seriously look at that position. Because when we looked at class sizes at the high school, at Greeley High School, um, it wasn't the science department specifically. It was across the board 
our class sizes are very small right now at the high school level. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for it. One of them is that the enrollment at the high school is at the lowest that it's been in years. Um, and that was a forecasted low. We're gonna be seeing increases later. And when those increases occur, we will act accordingly. But we're not gonna fill positions right now uh, when they're vacant uh, with the class sizes that we have um, based on that. And again, not, it's, it's gonna be through attrition. That was one of our, that's one of my criteria. No one's losing their job. Uh, but when we have an opportunity um, to look at our class sizes and make those adjustments, um, when a school is low or high, we're going to do that. Um, we have two years of low kindergarten. We know that right now. This is we're going into the second year. Rebecca Wandell's kindergarten numbers are spot on right now. What we expected for registrations for next year. That means we have two low years where we have too much staff, too many teachers or positions, I should say at the Wilson School. Uh, we know that those numbers are gonna go up in the third year. We're gonna increase in enrollment again. But when we have, we have attrition, we have vacant positions, we need to look seriously at that and not just keep filling those positions when we don't need them. And so those are things that I feel I've gotta be responsive to the board uh, and the community fiscally when we have those opportunities. Um, and when the enrollment goes back up in the high school, we're gonna see in a few years, the enrollment's gonna be going up dramatically. We're gonna be adding positions to the high school at that point. And we've done, you know, since I've been superintendent, I've always done this. I've recommended positions be removed when we don't need them, and I've recommended many more times that we add positions when we need them in order to keep up with enrollment, increases, class sizes, keep them down. Um, but when we have opportunities to, to do the opposite, we have to do that too. Um, and so that's why those three positions were put uh, forward. And again, I'll say this again, they're at the high school level right now. Another, if there's another vacancy, I'm gonna look very seriously at not filling that vacancy in a different content area. Because across the board, we found that we had uh, lower class sizes um, than anywhere else in the school district, except for the very youngest um, students in our primary school because of the kindergarten, um, two years of kindergarten enrollment coming in low. And those are adjustments that, as a school district, we have to make. Um, we have to put those things out there and adjust accordingly um, and look at all those, those pieces when we're putting a budget together. So hopefully I answer your question. Mostly, yes. I, um, I guess <coughs> my concern is maybe less about class sizes and more um, about the email that we got about science classes that themselves that will be potentially eliminated. Can you speak to that? So I can't speak specifically. I mean, I've had many conversations with the school administration, with Mr. Francis in particular, um, and making sure that our options are viable, that we put forward something that you look across the continuum, is it viable? Um, at different years, we offer different electives in different content areas. Sometimes we're offering more electives, sometimes we're offering less electives to students um, in every content area across the board. So. Um, those things change depending on, sometimes it's teacher <laughs> preference. We have a course that a teacher is teaching and they retire and they don't, no one picks that course up as an elective again. Um, we also have um, just interest of students. A lot of, you know, the w why courses are filled or not filled, we don't run courses sometimes that are in our class um, catalog um, because there's not enough students who are interested in that particular elective and will not take the course. So those electives will fluctuate from, from time to time. But um, certainly not a uh, necessarily a science uh, department uh, issue. And as opportunities come up for the next three years, the school is, will remain at the same level of enrollment before it starts to go up. If there's other vacancies, we're gonna certainly look very, very carefully at those. the chair. <laughs> Senator, yeah, I mean, you're, I also want to honor the fact that you're a district employee in the department that we're talking about. So I know I've, I've let um, uh, Shapiro come up and say really quickly, I'm very frugal. If you don't know me, I, I do believe in keeping the budget down. I, I'm a taxpayer in this, this community. So I agree that we should try to keep the budget down where we can. Uh, one thing I, you just mentioned that I think it's important for the, you to understand is that, you know, I, 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 I can't wait to the day we don't talk about COVID anymore, but uh, I think that we increased staffing because of COVID. 
uh, we're still feeling the repercussions to, co to COVID. I think my sophomore class uh, development, emotionally, behaviorally, development. I feel like I'm teaching seventh graders right now, my 10th graders. Uh, it, they just didn't, they missed some stuff when they did remote learning. Uh, and uh, it takes a lot more energy <laughs> to, to deal with them. And, you know, sometimes it's not when you add, like, you have 14 kids and you go to 16, it's not a line, it's, it's logarithmic. You know, the more kids, there's more issues in that room. So I just wanted you to know that that's still part of the problem is that the kids, uh, my seniors, I, I, I teach two sections of seniors, they're academically not where kids were two or three years ago when I taught the same class. Uh, and, and it just takes a lot more work. And I just, I'm concerned, I think all my class, I've got two classes that are 23 or 24 next year. And then my sophomore CP classes are all be about 19 each year. And uh, I think I'm just concerned about behavior and being able to support those kids. Uh, and I think part of it is still, it's the kind of the COVID backlash still. That's it. Thank you. Tommy? Just to provide a, uh, a student anecdote um, and kind of a more personal touch to this, with uh, the removal of this position, um, AP Bio will no longer be taught at the high school. And I've talked with students who are sophomores now, rising juniors, that um, will not have advanced bio opportunities at the high school um, and are going to be taking bio classes at USM uh, next year instead of being provided with AB Bio um, and that is currently in place and has been in place over the past few years as well. Can I ask Tom your question or it might be Dr. Baca I'm asking the question too but is that so I haven't heard that piece yet that must be a recent development is that because of a teacher change and not necessarily because we don't have yeah. enough money to offer? No, yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's, it's who's trained to be teaching those courses. I think the AP bio teacher needs to cover more CP and honors classes mm -hmm. um, due to the teacher that's leaving not being able to teach those CP bio classes, which then I think bumps AP bio out. Okay. I'm going to look into that a little bit more. I think AP Bio class had four students signed up for next year. Okay. And so we're okay. going to sit there and say, that's the first to go. We had to ask that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do offer other advanced bio classes. And so um, it makes sense to me if that's the one that has to go, we have to say yes. Yeah, that, I appreciate that. Andrew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that because we don't run courses <coughs> generally mm -hmm. with only four students in them, that's generally, we, don't, we generally don't do that. Yeah, what is the, like, how many? It depends if it's, uh, there's courses that are required as part of a program or whatnot, we'll run it, um, but we, we don't run classes generally below five okay. or six uh, at the high school, and we're really careful about those too. I mean, we're, that, that's a very low number for a class okay. yeah, for us to run. That's helpful context. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on the um, budget public hearing? Okay. That's it. All right, no. great, we'll close that. I would just add that on the 22nd, the board will vote whether to adopt the budget or not, or as it was presented, or make adjustments, uh, et cetera. And there will be adjustments that I will present on the 22nd. As Scott mentioned, there's some things that we're still working through, so there'll be some adjustments, minor, usually minor, uh, hopefully to the budget on the 22nd that I'll present. There'll be a whole nother stack of paperwork. That's oh, yeah, there's another stack of <laughs> warrants and calling the election. I, I have a question then relatedly. Um, is that something then that depending on where our health insurance rates come in, if they came in lower than we've budgeted, could we reconsider the, the high school science position? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the board's decision, um, whether or not you would like to reconsider any items that are in the budget. If you know, you can reconsider even without that and, and set a different percentage on the 22nd if you choose to do that. Yeah, um, I would also say, though, that the, the valuation shifts in Cumberland and North Yarmouth, too, um, we may want to consider what we add back to the budget and don't because that'll push us if we add that in and our health insurance rates are high, you know, it's seven or higher. Well, that's certainly going to push us over four percent in Cumberland, so we'll, we'll want to think about that a little bit. Yeah, we would have the information if if that was the case um, yeah I mean the board has the right to adopt it as presented or make it amendments and adjustments mm -hmm. at that point 
as it adopts because it becomes the board's budget on April 22nd. Okay. Thank you. All right, superintendent's report. All right, um, I actually have a briefer report tonight. Oh. So, at Mabel I. Wilson School, um, we had a principal for an hour, the PTO, Greeley PTO, sponsors this every year, and this year, Bryson Gaudet was able to serve as the Mabel I. Wilson School principal for an hour um, alongside Principal Muncie. So um, I always know that's an exciting um, hour for the student who's selected. At the middle school, four or five, the baseball and softball teams actually at the high school came down and helped greet the GMS four or five students as they celebrated Jackie Robinson Day. And as you can see, uh, Sea Dog Slugger also came to celebrate with the students um, that day as well. Really Middle School 6-8, spread the word for inclusion, um, and that's the um, ending, it used to be called End the Word, um, it's now called Spread the Word for Inclusion. Uh, so last week during lunch, students invited, um, other, uh, invited students to sign a poster showing their support for and commitment to uh, inclusion and acceptance of every student in the school community. At the high school, the Best Buddies of Maine held their second annual Best Buddies prom. Um, I heard it was really exciting. There were strobe lights and everything, if I remember hearing about that. And Footloose, um, yes, it had to um, carry over to another weekend because of the wonderful ice storm that we had, um, but it did uh, pull off with a great production. I believe it sold out all three performances. I mean, or not, very not close. A, not without another hitch. Right? I know, and then another the lights went out again. Power, <laughs> um, power outage, but the show continued in, in all three productions uh, were able to close the curtain, so. Um, just a, a, a fantastic performance. I was able to see it as well. I'm just really impressed um, with the caliber of the students um, and just the, the energy level um, with this production. It was amazing. Um, so hats off to the student actors and actresses and to um, Jen Fox, uh, the director. March was Women's History Month um, and uh, the high school civil rights team assembled Minute of Mom gift bags for main needs. Um, and <laughs> distributed those, uh, and that was something that the Civil Rights Club, I don't know if Community Service Club also helped with that, or might have not included that, right? Maybe, I can't remember. And then joining us, I know uh, probably Megan is gonna talk about this, so I won't talk in any detail, but there is a, there's several opportunities um, for um, participation in the school project and getting more information, asking questions. There are four online sessions, each topical, and there are three in-person opportunities. The virtual opportunities uh, will start the week after the vacation. Um, there'll be one every week on a different day of the week with different topics, including um, uh, the school design, turf field. Um, there'll be a safety session, and there'll be one on finance and um, what it would cost you, um, the taxpayer. So, uh, those sessions are coming up. I'm sure Megan will talk about it. Just a reminder that there is a full day, Wednesday this week, and not a half day. We have put that information out, but just keep reminding people. And on the 8th, um, it's an early release on Monday the 8th for the eclipse. And that's my report. Can I ask a quick question about the um, going back a couple slides to the, I know it's not technically an information session, but should May 20th be on this flyer um, for the referendum, the one that I read, the one that I made a motion for? Um, yes, you mean the public hearing on the, the public financing? Hearing, yes, yeah. that would be a public hearing on the financing of the project, yes. And so should that go on this list, do you think? So that was just, that's part of just the statutory process <laughs> that we have to follow, so we didn't include these. These are just more if people want to get more information, want to ask okay. questions. Okay. Um, they start, people can certainly speak on May 20th about that. We can put that on the schedule if you'd like. Okay. Well, matter. I guess, that, yeah, it's a probably conversation yep. for the committee. But, uh, okay. Can add that? Yeah, we can add that on. Do you have your solar eclipse glasses? <laughs> I have a stack of them. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we're going to move to committee reports. I'll oh, start with the students, Sophia. Okay, so this is pretty relevant to the student survey results that we looked over in the slideshow, but today, 
during advisory, we had an assembly where we had a speaker come and talk about how the choices we make now matter. And that was specifically talking about, his story was about substance abuse and his journey through it and what he's done and how he's overcome it. But I think from like my whole high school career, this has been one of the most influential like speakers that we've had. It was, I mean, I had lunch right after and I think every single table was talking about what they thought. And I think it was honestly like one of the most, like it was just really meaningful and I heard so many students reflecting on it. And yeah, I was really happy and I would have been happy for him to keep on talking. And I know that like other students were sad how short it was, but it was, I was really impressed with him. Um, class of 2025, working on prom, very exciting. It's really coming together. We had our flyer get posted on our Instagram account, so yay. <laughs> um, and then also, this is kind of less relevant, but parking issues have always been a hot topic. And on Thursday, we had six spots in the senior lot open up. And I got a parking spot <laughs> from the raffle. So that's very exciting. <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> yeah, so the quarter also ended on Friday. So with the end of third quarter, that kind of marks the official beginning of senior spring. Um, and in a lot of my classes today, we outlined the uh, calendar for the rest of the year of preparing for exams and what what the rest of the year will look like and it's kind of shocking how few days we have left in school um, with April break coming up and um, also the spring season the spring sports season started last Monday um, beginning with uh, the um, a lot of icy conditions at the beginning of the week which um, were made it off to a rocky start and probably going to be off to a rockier start um, in the middle of this week with the snowstorm. Um, but the play also concluded the last two shows, um, as in the superintendent's report, and uh, unfortunately the power went out right at the end of Act 1 um, on Friday night. And um, yeah, that is my student report. <laughs> Thanks, Tommy. All right, we'll go to the Community Engagement Committee. All this right. is very exciting tonight, right? We have the, the date for the referendum, and now you're going to hit the ground running. Stuff is happening. Um, the Community Engagement Committee uh, is very happy to remind the board to please review the Sign Up Genius, which has our in-person events listed, and I would love it if everybody could sign up for one that they could attend, or two, or maybe all three. For instance, this Saturday, April 6th, this flyer is probably sitting right next to you. We have an in-person event in North Yarmouth at the Community Center. Um, from 4 to 5.30, snacks will be provided. And we, this one will be more of a Q&A. We, we will hit the ground running with some specific answers to questions and then open the floor up to community members to answer questions. The next two in-person events include um, May 4th, We'll have an on-site walkthrough at 11 a.m. with Don Foster, so literally on-site here on the ground. And Monday, May 13th, this is our last in-person event. It's um, at Valhalla at 6 p.m. Steve Blatt will be there to present the school project again, and we'll open the floor up to Q&A. Um, so as many of you as can attend and be support and answer questions would be incredibly welcome and appreciated. Do you mind sending that sign out? sign up genius sheet out again okay um, communications have already gone out big thanks to superintendent Porter and Melissa Porter for doing that we've got some nice things on the MSAD um, Instagram account um, on the PTO foundation 51 is coming and in the crier more of that will come with a slightly different look but look for posts a couple posts every week um, there, as, as Superintendent Porter said, there are going to be four online <laughs> events, and um, they're on that slide. Um, these are not necessarily, th these aren't in-person events that we want people to attend, but if you can be there for part of these, that would be wonderful. Um, so we'll get that information out as well. Um, Chef, where is this slide? Can this slide? 
It, this slide is connected to the um, the graphic, mm -hmm. the full graphic. I just pulled it out mm -hmm. and, and copied it. Do you want it somewhere else? Yeah, I think it's on the back of the. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> on the back I of the one page. Oh, just great. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there they are. There are the in-person events, uh, the the online and in-person events. And those will also be recorded and, and posted. Right, so much more flexible. Yes. Yeah. Can I add something, Megan? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just wanted, for those of you who haven't read the, um, the letter that went out from the board that was in the superintendent newsletter that went out on Friday, right? Um, it lists all the ways that we have created opportunities to communicate with us, whether it's email, coming to meetings, these um, sessions. Um, and uh, I, I know that this gets confusing. Sometimes people think that they have to copy and paste every single one of our emails. And actually, if you just do, is it school board at ms8051.org? Is that right? Or is it just board? Isn't there just the one? Oh, okay, so the the community can't do it that way? Okay, all right. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> that would be lovely if that, I, I thought that was um, doable, but either way, um, there are many, many, many ways to get a hold of us and to come talk to us, and we recommend that you look at that letter to look at that entire exhaustive list. Great, and you're bringing it up on on screen yeah, Denny. It's, it's not actually on this I'm sorry Hi, Megan um, so <clears throat> I, I believe that that the number that people are going to be looking for at these meetings is what is it going to cost me mm -hmm. how are you going to communicate that to them great question yeah uh, uh, if you if you can't give them a straight answer right. they will be very mad right yeah, I think, well, the next uh, committee update is, is finance, and I know that um, that is going to be a hot topic. So mm -hmm. do we want to move to that and the timing of when we'll have that information? Because I know it's it's going to be relatively shortly. Um, I agree, Denny. We need, we need that number. That we I had re have received right one minute. communication uh, at a citizen group that I mentioned it, to, to the idea that uh, – if it weren't too expensive, an individual mailing to each taxpayer is indicating, you know, what your valuation is and what the mill rate is mm -hmm. would be a great thing. It may not be operationally possible, but. I think, it, I think that it can be operationally possible and we do have um, a mailer in the works. Um, so I appreciate that. I, do, I think you're right. I think that people want to know what's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know we've talked about maybe a, like a tool or something that allows people to do that as well. But I think that's yeah. a great the, the idea. Scarborough so. uh, School Department, which had a big push mm -hmm. and lost their referendum, by the way, um, and they uh, had a website in which you could, uh, you know, query your individual mm -hmm. tax rate and find out what it was right there. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's operationally possible. But. That's that's a great question, and, <coughs> I, and I'm not totally sure how that, uh, where to get that, but I love that idea. I think that we can look into that yeah, for sure. I, I think we can look yeah. into something like that. Yeah. So, Thanks great. for the feedback. That's, that's, I think, a great point. Because, yes, that is the question that everyone wants to know. <laughs> yes. And yes, as the taxpayers, us as well, right? <laughs> Um, finance. Yes, so um, uh, I confess we need to get a meeting on the calendar. Um, Scott, do you think it's feasible for us to schedule something this week or should we aim for next week? This week I don't think we'd have the plan of financing in place. So um, currently what we're doing is looking to try and set up a joint facilities and finance meeting mm -hmm. uh, together. Um, I think in order to have all the numbers and have what we need, it'll probably happen after the vacation break in order to do that, after the April break in order to get those numbers. We just started meeting with bond counsel and financial advisors, um, our financial advisor, uh, because obviously we just know what the number is, right, and coming up to that, uh, that number. Um, we're starting to work on preliminary debt service schedules, what the debt looks like, and a plan of financing around that. So. So rather than put something out that's not accurate, I think we should probably wait until following the break in order to um, have that meeting, and we should have that information available at that time. Okay, so we'll aim for that later in the month, and then we'll really need to move after that to get yep. to communicate uh, to the public. All right. 
um, policy. Yeah. Um, we met and um, the focus of the last policy meeting was involving an update to um, our AP policy because it currently um, well, was so outdated that it did not address the IB offerings that we have. And so um, be working on getting that to a first read here soon. Great. Thanks, Sam. Facilities. So our next meeting um, was scheduled for Friday, um, but as you just heard, probably we are gonna try to have a joint one mm -hmm. with um, finance, so we're gonna do that after vacation, so no meeting on Friday. Okay, because we'll be Friday's too, too soon. Right, and that was our regular scheduled one, mm -hmm. but we, we wanna do it joint with finance. It might be snowed out in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, for this remote. <laughs> All right, curriculum. <clears throat> Uh, for curriculum, we were supposed to meet last Monday, but there was a snow day, so we were um, <laughs> postponed. Uh, we're, we only have one currently scheduled meeting for the rest of the year, and that's in June, so we're going to try to change our, our schedule. Um, there are a few um, agenda items that we really want to address. One is the, how the new school configuration is going to um, impact curriculum. Um, and then the other one, I, I'm, I feel so sad. Sarah Rose sat here for like two and a half hours and I was excited to share that we were planning on talking about the pre-K um, pilot. Um, so that is the other uh, agenda item. Okay, thank you. Um, equity. Nothing new since our last meeting. We have a meeting this week if the snow <coughs> holds off until seven o'clock. Wednesday night, <laughs> but yes, it is our plan to meet this week. We have an agenda out if anyone wants to look at it. And one of the things that we will be talking about is um, revamping our website so that we can update it and make it um, make sure we have all the resources on there that people need and want. Great. And then any ad hoc committee reports? <laughs> I'll quickly go. Um, so we have our next community partners meeting with representatives from PTO and Foundation 51 on Wednesday. And then also on Wednesday, and forgive me, but I'll read this from my phone. So PTO is hosting an event called Project iGuardian, which apparently is presented by Homeland Security um, and is designed to inform students, parents, educators, and law enforcement about the risks that children face in the online environment. And that is happening in this room on this Wednesday, April 3rd at 6 p.m. They do ask that you register in advance if possible. Great, thank you. Any other ad hoc committees? Yes. Regarding the GCA, oh, sorry, okay. go. Jeez, sorry, we have a dropout prevention committee meeting um, on Wednesday at 2.30 in room 151. Um, again, I'm sure the snow is going to hold off, so <laughs> we'll be there. <laughs> GCA? Yes, I just wanted to share a very um, uplifting, happy story um, regarding the GCA. I was there for the Footloose, um, one of the performances, and an adult walked over to me and we started chatting about the one campus plan, which he's very excited about actually. And he kind of started to look around at the GCA and told me about how he had brought his son when his son was a middle schooler and the GCA was under construction. And they walked around and it was really just bare bones at that point, but they could see the stage. And his son said, I'm gonna be on that stage one day. And his dad said, yeah, you are. And sure enough, uh, he's a senior and he was in Footloose. And um, it was just really wonderful, a really wonderful reminder that these kind of decisions that we make are really tough um, and they're always expensive and they're always um, emotional. And here we are, however many years later, I think he was in sixth grade um, when it was being built and just the, the absolute joy and the number of kids from all different backgrounds who were able to contribute to make this show happen. That was one of the things I really loved. Those of you who went to the show, Jennifer Fox talked about how you have kids who were building sets. My son w got exposed to tools that he 
never knew he, how to use, and he was so excited. Um, and you had kids who had leadership opportunities as a stage manager or as a dance <laughs> captain, and you had kids who were painting and very artistic, and you had music kids, and um, it was just a fantastic, very affirming night um, for me as someone who had to suck in my breath when I um, found out how much the GCA was gonna cost and voted yes with my fingers crossed. Um, it was a fantastic event. Thank you, Kim. Any other ad hoc committees? Okay, so we'll move to our last regular um, agenda, which is communications. Um, we do have the 2024-25 board calendar. There's a copy of it in um, everyone's folder. This reflects the change in meetings from Mondays to Thursdays. Well, it sounds like a better option now. We'll see when we actually <laughs> we'll, we'll go through a year and see right and is. see see how that lands. Um, but is this just for information only right now, and just to see once everyone sees the dates if they have any questions, um, maybe use it as a marketing tool for anyone considering wanting to to serve on the board, knowing what the calendar is. Um, so that's available um, in your packets. Any questions? And I feel like curse talking about calendars and how we were talking about the last day of school and now <laughs> we, we, we look down uh, the weather forecasts uh, this yeah, week. I think we, yeah, I'm not, it's usually in Maine, of course, beginning, middle, or end, and it's at the end. It's at the end this year. Thank um, you. I am going to pass these around. These are QR codes. Uh, we've been putting them up in different parts of the uh, towns. Uh, we've already got people putting them up. Um, they're on our school building doors and stuff like that. Um, but if you have places that you could ask somebody, a public establishment, to put them on the door, um, there are QR codes on both sides. So somebody can just snap their camera and capture it. It goes right to our building, uh, school building page on our website uh, is where it goes. And um, so it's an easy way to, um, to get to that page and navigate it. It's on our website, so it directly goes there. And, uh, and you can see the information that is there and the most current information uh, about the building school building project so um, please you know feel free to take those and put them wherever you want Thanks. they're in the town offices right now I think they're in the library we've got one I believe hanging there if you don't see one please put it up thank you or ask it's a great idea yeah. to have that so thank you mm -hmm. All right, so um, I would like to ask for a motion to enter executive session to consult with legal counsel regarding the legal rights and duties of the board of directors with respects to a grievance pursuant of state statute 1 MRSA 4056E. Uh, and also, do you want to sign the paperwork now for, um, the, uh, for the project? Yes. I think we should do it before we lose people. Okay. At the end. Can we still vote or we um, have to hold? No, we have to hold off before you vote. Okay. We need yeah, to hold off. First, so. okay. okay. Thank you. Um, can we excuse students? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm assuming they don't sign. No. So. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. So the uh, first document that I'm going to start at one end, and the first documents that will be coming down is the warrant. The still on it. Is that one? Oh, it is. No, that's okay. It's part of the public meeting. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the first document that will be coming down through for signature will be the warrant and notice of election. And if everybody could sign in the same spot on every one of these documents. So we'll start at the end down here, and if you can just sign in the same spot on every document. The second uh, document that will be coming down will be the notice of the public hearing. So both of these documents, um, the first set of documents on the warrants and notice of election will be countersigned by the select board in North Yarmouth and by the uh, council in Cumberland. And then the notice of election, um, uh, or the, excuse me, the notice of public hearing will be signed just by the board. And both of these documents get uh, posted in the community to notify the community of, of the warrant notice and election and the public hearing. So that's the purpose of these two documents. And you signed in the same space on every same single spot. on every single right. one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, right there on the top. 
avoid it. I, yeah. I have others. Um, and then, Megan, you can just sign right underneath. Okay. And we'll just keep it going all the way down. I think it's, I think it's gonna live. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 one. <laughs> they're, they're folded, honey. Yeah. Fold it over. Again, same same place on every document. <coughs> okay. Okay. Everybody needs to sign on the same line. I just real. I hope no one has a nut allergy over here. I just oh. realized I just oh. started to eat some nuts and. Brief signature. It's really helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm really lean at that shoulder. What are you doing as a teacher? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Exactly. One of those medical teachers. <coughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> By the end, there's a penmanship contest to yeah. see who has the best. Yeah. It. There's a lot of process in this, so. The next one um, making its way down is just a notice of public <coughs> hearing and you just sign on the front page.
Last one coming down. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> 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 And for women's basketball fans, Iowa 82, LSU 71 with three oh minutes wow. to go. I was wondering. Thank you. <laughs> three minutes to go. Oh. Mm -hmm. you, I think it's no, is Notre Dame out? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Because that has a Greeley grad. I know, right? <laughs> is it really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> USC playing tonight, too? or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Starts at it's supposed to start at nine. Uh, well, I really like the story of Thank Patricia. 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 Water running and everything. <coughs> no, cross, cross it. <laughs> oh, are we gonna take a vote? Thank you. Sorry, I'm just my stuff. It's nowhere in the way. <laughs> I saw you go and I was like. Darn it. And now Kim's gone. Can we still? We're all set. <sighs> oh, okay. Procedures. <laughs> They're so important. <laughs> oh. Okay, so can we, can I try this again? Yes. Okay. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to enter executive session to consult with legal counsel regarding the legal rights and duties of the board of directors with respect to a grievance pursuant state statute one MRSA 4056E? So moved. <laughs> Annika, second. second. Okay, thank you, Megan. All in favor? Thank you. 